Greetings to everyone. Uh, thank you all for returning to Social Business Day 2021. We've, we hope that you had an exciting start and you've enjoyed all the conversations and the experiences that we have shared thus far. And if you thought that was exciting, you've got no idea what's coming. We've got a power pack session throughout the rest of the day, which will kick off with uh, plenary two, which is no going back. What does a pand post pandemic economy look like? organized by Unisocial Business, following which we will have the much awaited third plenary, which is the global pharma social business being organized by Grameen Creative Labs. And then we'll have a very important keynote speech from Ms. Zi Ling, the Vice President of Kaihin Media on the topic, speech on empowering women entrepreneurship, followed by social business updates. And of course, the last plenary of the day, healthcare as a social business in the context of pandemic and post-pandemic era. Without further ado, please allow me to now introduce the moderator of Plenary 2, No Going Back, What Does a Post-Pandemic Economy Look Like? Our very good friend, Suresh Krishna, co-founder, CEO, and managing director of Unisocial Business Foundation, Bengaluru. Suresh, over to you to conduct the session. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Prometheus. Good morning, good, good evening. Good afternoon to wherever you are in the world. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, Professor, and so nice to see you. Hi, Saskia and Lamia, and my great panel. It's a very interesting uh, panel we have. We are uh, talking today uh, uh, about how COVID-19 has impacted us and how we are all responding to it, and how do we see ourselves into the post-COVID era. I'm sure all of us have different, different experiences across the world. There are experiences in our uh, probably not found hospital beds. Somebody has not found uh, medicine. Somebody is waiting to get a vaccine. Somebody has already got vaccine. Uh, we have uh, lost the near and dear ones uh, around here. And a lot of people have lost jobs around here. A lot of people have got new jobs, by the way. And a lot of people who probably never thought they can work from home have started working from home. And they're actually, some people say that their productivity levels have astronomically increased everywhere. Uh, but this, it's a completely a mixed bag of you know, what's been happening because of this uh, COVID, uh, which has impacted. Of course, COVID was uh, stuck um, uh, without any giving any warning signals to us. And each one has reacted differently and so much of uh, chaos is also it has created. Majority, even though only a small section of people who have the ability to work from home or can actually do things remotely have been enjoying. But a lot of people have been struggling with our jobs, without food, without uh, knowing what the future is going to be and so on. We from Unis Social Business have actually found many of our portfolio companies have been struggling and what is have been happening to their own clients. So we kind of uh, uh, started responding to that situation in our, in our own little way. There were some companies where uh, more particularly uh, uh, in the first wave, they could not pay salaries because all of a sudden their revenues got stopped. So they did not know how to move forward. I mean, there are many employees uh, uh, did not know where the salaries is going to come from. Nobody had maintained any kind of reserves that time to kind of uh, pay salaries. So YSB, um, Fabulous donors who supported YSP actually supported some of the salaries of many people, many of these uh, employees from social businesses. And it's not just employees, clients of uh, unit social business uh, portfolio companies were also struggling. So they've been supported by either by providing food for some time or some subsistence alliances or some medicines and so on. But in our own little way, <laughs> Uh, but it, this whole pandemic has really put all of us and shaken everything. Like Professor saying back, and we should not be going back and uh, uh, after this COVID vanishes and instead we should recreate a world which is more better than what it was, uh, what we have been living so far. But generally, if you all think about, what do you all think about? How do, how do we think that uh, the world is going to come out of this pandemic? I mean, are you going to be pessimistic? Or are you looking at, it's going to be more or less same, it's just the same thing. Or are we talking about, it's going to be worse before it's going to be better uh, again? Or are you so optimistic that you know, things will be all good? Or is it, how is the new world going to be for us? These are some questions probably 
all of us uh, I think about each one of us might have a different feeling maybe fabulous panelists who can probably share their experiences and how they have been dealing with the pandemic but before that i would like to ask saskia uh, who is a co-founder of your research business to just give her views on what she thinks how the post pandemic world is going to be looking like saskia over to you Thanks, Suresh, and I'll also be very um, brief um, because I know we have amazing um, entrepreneurs um, like Anna and Saiti here on the panel, and I'd rather hear from their very practical experience. <clears throat> But basically, maybe just to take one step back, like roughly a year ago when obviously the pandemic uh, started, or actually in March of last year, so a little bit longer than a year, uh, we of course were totally shocked and were worried right away that Um, this will have a significant effect on these um, amazing social businesses that we have in our portfolio. Um, and our biggest worry was to say at the end of the year, would they still be surviving or would they not be surviving? Um, and so we realized at that point, um, we usually provide debt to the companies. We realized at that point that probably additional debt would not help them at this stage, but quick pivot uh, to actually provide them with grant funding to continue paying salaries. It's something that in Germany, my home country, we call Kurzarbeit, so uh, short work. Um, and it is something that, for example, the many European governments have been providing to, um, uh, to companies um, here in our geographies. Um, so these companies had time to breathe, time to adapt, um, and time to sort of retool for kind of the next phase, um, where sort of COVID is unfortunately still part of the, the, the picture. Um, and in the, many of the geographies where we're working in, like East Africa, in India, and also in Brazil, these types of governmental support programs either didn't exist, or if they existed, they were so small or so difficult to access for any of our social business entrepreneurs that we felt we needed to play the role uh, briefly of, um, of helping these companies survive. And, and that's what we've done. And uh, Suresh uh, mentioned that, and I'm sure Anna and Saiti will be talking about that. Um, to at least ensure that these companies had a little bit of extra room to breathe and then to adapt to the new realities because COVID is going to stay with us for, for, for a little bit longer. Everybody helping others, but the, the problem was so huge that you no know, one could not really help everybody. And so hence, we have seen a lot of struggles. So actually, it's interesting so, um, to see, actually, we should hear from our panelists more because they are being in the front line of receiving all those uh, the heat which was in the field. I think we have a fabulous panelist um, here who are speaking from uh, uh, their own experience, who will be speaking from their own experience. They are from, uh, we have uh, Sahiti from India who, who heads this, uh, she's also director of Waste Ventures India who works with in waste management space. We have Anna from Ubi who has been doing education loans for uh, people so that they can yeah, learn and uh, new things and get employed much better. We have Yoko uh, from Gramin Yuglina. Um, each one of them have different experiences, and I'm sure they're going to be talking to you and enlightening you all what how they have been dealing with this issue. So uh, let me just, uh, without wasting much time, let me talk to uh, each one of the panelists. Uh, I start from India because I'm from India, so I take the privilege to start from India this time. Uh, Sahiti, I mean, you at West Ventures have been working with West Pickers, uh, who are um, uh, more important thing when everything shut down. The waste generated from every household or corporations became a very uh, uh, important issue. How do you dispose them? That is the source of infection. That's the source of uh, problem. If it is, you one can't keep at home and one has to dispose it properly. And your waste bankers all itself were all facing trouble because of the lockdowns everywhere. So how, what was the challenges your waste bankers actually faced? And uh, how did you, what did you do? How did you support them or... Uh, How could you, uh, and also may, uh, maybe you should also talk about how can you mitigate some of those uh, difficulties what the waste pickers have? What have you done for them? Over uh, to you, Saiti. Yeah, thank you so much, Suresh. Um, wonderful to be on here and then uh, look back at the last year and a half, time flies, um, and uh, just look back on all the initiatives that we've taken and the way we've grown as a company. Um, sir, happy birthday. I take this opportunity to wish you. And then uh, maybe our experiences and our impact has all been because of you. So this might be a small birthday gift from us to you. So um, a brief flashback to March is, um, as Suresh rightly said, we were one of the companies who had no reserves uh, for emergencies. We were running month to month. 
the way Waste Ventures operates is on one hand, we partner with bulk waste generators like corporate companies, schools, um, households, etc., to collect their waste and sort recyclables and sell them to recyclers. On the other hand, we partner with almost 1,500 waste pickers to um, collect low value plastics from them, um, give them an additional income, and as well as pull out non recyclable waste from the environment. Now, last March, uh, we were in a pretty good space where many of our projects were finally going to get started. We have stabilized a business model, we're finally profitable, and then boom, lockdown, right? So 30% of our, um, or more of our revenues come from corporates. They have completely shut down. Uh, many of our corporates who, um, like Google, Facebook, et cetera, they've announced that, you know, they will be shutting off for some time indefinitely. So no revenues from there. Uh, schools and colleges, we all know what happened. Zero business from there. And uh, being a heavy, heavily um, op heavy company, uh, we did suffer. Uh, at one point, we were considering um, shutting down. We did shut down our operations. But being a company with very, very low turnover rate, and I think Suresh can watch for that. We, we do not lay off and our employees don't leave us so easily. It's been um, highly challenging to kind of navigate that space where should we should we keep them on? How do we pay the salaries? How do we run the business? What is the way ahead? It was all um, it was all a very tough time for us. Um, and I think apart from the logistical challenges, the morale of our staff was severely hit because uh, even if the operations were to resume, we did not see um, a way to quick profitability. Profitability. We did not see how we were going to sustain ourselves. We were. I think the staff um, kind of were doubting our ability as a company. Um, and I say this in retrospection, um, it's a complete 180 from last March to this June. Uh, so the way we've uh, received help was uh, from YSB through one of the um, one of the grants. They've helped pay um, our staff salaries for uh, the next six to seven uh, months, right? So first we got a breathing space more than that, what has severely boosted our morale was our um, our efforts, our being implementing partners to distribute ration kits to almost 6,000 waste because when we were first given that opportunity to put forward a proposal, I don't think many of us believed that we could carry it off. Um, carrying that out successfully, actually going on ground, interacting with the waste pickers, now, these waste pickers have lost their source of income, which is segregating recyclables and selling them. Now, suddenly, this segregation has fallen below everyone's radar of priorities. Um, these waste pickers were highly infected. They don't know, they don't know where um, healthcare is uh, going to be accessible. They were in a very critical stage as well. Many of the waste pickers that we partner with have been living day to day at that point of time. So um, us actually going ahead and um, supplying ration and sanitation kits to almost 6,000 waste pickers for three months was a gigantic project for us. It has, I think, boosted the morale of our waste pickers as well. Receiving that aid for three months helped them kind of reset and then refocus on their income. Um, more than that, for us personally, I can see it now. It boosted the staff of our morale, or the morale of our staff. They were confident that, you know, this is what we're here for. This is what our company does. And this is what we're still doing best, even after all the obstacles in our way, right? So I think that led to um, wonderful uh, network building among the waste pickers. Previously, we were partnering with 1,500 waste pickers. Now we are partnering with 6,000 waste pickers. It also helped us kind of look back and then change, I mean, to what a business model uh, to sustain these kind of challenges in the future. And uh, taking a leave from Suresh's uh, booklet, we are also very strongly trying to build a reserve to uh, sustain these kind of challenges in the future as well. And uh, many of our projects who, which were on the verge of taking off have taken off. Now we're in a really good um, stage where we're executing all those are actually paying back the debt uh, to YSBF uh, every month with a smile on our faces, which is a big thing for us. Um, you know, it's not a burden anymore. It's a joy to be able to do that. So um, very briefly, this has been the recap. We'll be happy to speak about anything else in depth. And um, one more thing I would like to mention was that this has opened up a new 
um, new uh, path of activities for us to do. So we are proposing this more and more to the brands that we partner with as well. Um, all the commercial transactions that they do with us can have a socio-economic angle now. So um, plastic recyclers, brands who collect plastic back from us now, for every kg of plastic they pick up from us, they're investing a rupee into socio-economic uh, welfare activities for the waste pickers. And the way we're um, confident we'll be able to execute those is because we've executed a much, much bigger project last year in the middle of um, the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, I'm sure we'll be seeing many more ripple effects in the months to come, but so far that's been our journey. Saiti, one follow-up question on, uh, on what you have done. Yeah. You have been, uh, the whole organization was used to only collecting plastic and then re I mean, sending it to recycling and so on. That was your major work. But when this pandemic happened, you all of a sudden had to turn into a relief organization. It was, uh, how was that experience? Because none of you were used to doing it or had even thought about you'll have to do something like that. Yeah. When everything was locked down, nobody was allowed to move around and yeah. uh, you had to do that. What was, what, did, what, what went on in your minds during that time and how did you uh, make that happen? Yeah. So um, again, when I said I was skeptical, the reason was also because of our staff. Uh, you know that our staff is a very, um, no one of us hesitates to go down on the ground. But then these situations were different and we, we could not ask our staff as well. So I promised them we will just do this for a month. And if any of them had any hesitations, we will, we will not hesitate to, you know, take those feedback and then do whatever is necessary. Um, but I think though our staff was skeptical at the beginning, it's a wonderful feeling to be able to help um, those in need and then see that help, right? It's, it's very easy to, and it's very important as well to donate money. But when you're on ground, when you're handing over a relief packet and all of our staff except me were involved in this operation, I, I was pregnant at that time, but that's why I did not go on ground. So every single person in our staff has got to experience that, um, that joy of, you know, um, seeing the impact, seeing the relief on the waste because faces um, hearing those words, um, and these are people we see day in and day out, right? So their um, their belief in us that they could turn to us in times of crisis have, I think, given them strength to carry through with the relief work. And because as you said, none of us had any experience with that. Um, it was a learning experience, learning curve to maintain so much data, to be accountable for every penny, um, to, um, to smooth over any hiccups um, as such. But um, I think we have carried it out. Uh, my team has carried it out beyond all our expectations. Thanks, Aditi. <laughs> One more thing. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Suresh. One yeah. more thing I would like to mention is that this also has given them um, the much needed push on focusing on households, focusing on food waste as well, because they were uh, they were able to see that um, just dealing with dry waste is not enough anymore um, to contribute to waste because we had doubled down on a focus to um, reduce food waste and allow for composting systems in in-house and off-site. So that has um, taken up in a big way, taken off in a big way after our uh, relief work as well. So households still consume, uh, produce a lot of waste. So we've pivoted and then our staff has been adapting every day since. Thank you, Zahiti. <clears throat> That's wonderful. Uh, let's move to Brazil and see what Anna has done. And uh, Anna, tell me something about you know, what Purvi does and then talk about how has your loans, how actually the education loans, what you have been giving away to your students, to the people, uh, what are the kind of learnings, what are the courses they're doing and how has them helped to combat the COVID? Thank you. Uh, for me, it's good morning here in Brazil. So good morning for everyone. <laughs> Uh, it's so nice to be here today and talk a little bit about what Prof Profi has done uh, during the last year. Um, when I, when you were speaking, I was making a retrospective in my mind and thinking about how we were in March 2020 and when the pandemic closed and we were okay, no one wants to do to get the low and to do some course now because everyone wants to be at home and save money and no one will spend more money in education but that was a mistake that we made looking for the the future because what we see 
is that many people lost their jobs and needed to learn a new skill or something to do to keep earning money and keep surviving and keep doing whatever they want. So uh, here, here in Brazil, uh, we work mostly with free courses. I don't know how do you call that in in the rest of the, of the world, but we don't work nowadays with undergraduate courses, the traditional way to learn and to, 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 to get a job because it's too expensive and it, it needs a lot of time so you can get a diploma and go to, to the market and get a job. So we work with those free courses and they are more intense and shorter than the uh, traditional undergraduate course. So one thing we, we've seen during the last year is that uh, people here in Brazil um, start to accept those kind of learning more than they did before the pandemic because the only way you can learn is from your home from your computer and the traditional way was not wasn't able anymore wasn't available anymore for them so that's one big change that we've seen and that we we hope it it will continue after the pandemic so uh, and the, the the kind of subject they study it's really broad because now we we do some loans for dev dev boot camps like data science and ux design or something like that in the tech area but we also do loans for service courses like beauty like i uh, i will do my something for my skin for my hair for my nails and that's a lot of different people that are learning something new to go and get a job and earn some money and maybe an extra income and not the the first income that you have but it's it's something really important during the pandemic so people can keep surviving and keep getting money and food in their table and everything else uh, and where's Provi in in the middle of all of that kind of courses we here in Brazil uh, we have a something that is cultural from Brazil. Uh, everyone is used to pay in credit cards with a lot of installments, but not everyone here in Brazil has a credit card. So if you don't have a credit card, you can't pay for something that is a little bit more expensive than what you have in the debit card or you have in your, in your account. So we build a... a we took the traditional student loan to that kind of use for uh, free courses that are shorter and even not so expensive than uh, undergraduate courses. And, and that gave the possibility for a lot of people to go and study that they didn't have that opportunity before the student loan for that kind of courses. And we didn't stop there. We brought to Brazil a model that is called ISA, Income Share Agreement. That is a model that you only start paying for the, the study that you have once you are employed above a minimum income. So if you take the courses and don't get a job, you don't pay for the study that you, you watch it and learn it. So that's a I am passionate about this model because it's it's really it's really changing the lives of the people that had studied with that. Now we just to give a little numbers about it, 70% of the people that has finished their courses after three months they finished their courses are employed above the minimum salary. So it's it's changing lives in, in the best way we can imagine because now they have an income and they can, they can give more stability for their families and maybe their children will start studying and everything else. So as we are, uh, we need to see the employability rate after the course. We can say that it's really changing their lives and they are getting, gain more income than, than they did before the courses. So 
uh, that's one thing we've done during the pandemic. And I think it's amazing to see those people changing their lives. And also, uh, as it's, it, it is important for us to close the cycle, so we give access to education, but if the people that are gaining those access don't go to and get a job, it's, it, it, it has an end. We need to make sure that when someone wants to study, to get a new job, to get a new career, to change their lives, we need to help that as well. So we do. We also have uh, employability er area here in Provi. So we ha we have people working in mentoring events, content to help them to to learn about a new. Uh, I don't know. Maybe here in Brazil, uh, maybe we have a Uber driver or something like that that wants to become a tech developer. Maybe he doesn't, he or she doesn't know where to look for a job. What are the companies? What do I need to know to to go to an interview? So we help them to learn that as well, so they can be more successful in the in the experience to get into a new career, into a new job. So uh, if I have to wrap up everything, in the beginning we were afraid because we thought okay everyone will cut the education costs from their lives but what we've seen is that many people lost their jobs many people need to reinvent their lives so they need to learn new things and to get access to those new skills or those new learnings the traditional ways to pay that for that isn't going to fill the gap for the Brazilian people. So that's where Provi entered and helped uh, everyone to 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 achieve their dreams. Now we are we we are just close to to help one hundred thousand people here in Brazil. So that's that's a huge number, and uh, it's not about just the number. One people that one person that has that access changed their lives and their family lives, but 100,000, it's a lot of people. So we are really happy with everything we've done during those, during the last year, even in the in this chaotic and world that we are living in. That's it, I think so. That's a tremendous uh, achievement. One lakh people reaching out is, uh, is, is a big number. Uh, um, yes. Um, can you tell me how much, how many uh, uh, students or uh, loans you had given before the COVID and during this last one year? How did the, uh, how did it all uh, increase? Or how did the growth come? Okay, uh, I don't remember exactly the number in March 2020, but uh, we did a, like a wrap up in the end of 2019, in the beginning of 2020, and we had. <laughs> give uh, access to less than to 1,000 people. So most of them were during the, the pandemic. Uh, it, it was 700, 700 people in the end of 2019. And now we are reaching 100,000 people. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So that means for all the people who wanted to learn new things, but your pandemic has given an opportunity for them to learn a yes. new skill. Yes, that's it. How many of them uh, could actually get new employment? Uh, the new employment uh, that we really measure is the one from the ISA students because it's part of the model. They only start paying after they are employed. And when I look to those data, I am talking of less people than the 100,000. And now we are reaching 2,000 people studying during the in, in a ISA model. But graduated from an ISA model, we have we have uh, around 500. And from those 500 people that had graduated, we have 70% with achievement achieved a new employment after three months they finished the course. So that's the the number nowadays 
that's that's very nice and uh, yes yes really nice to yes. see that so many people are learning and getting benefited from growing yes so i'll yes. come back to you with a couple of more questions let me okay. talk to uh, uh okay bye bye uh, uh you hang on we still have a lot of questions for you uh <clears throat> So I think these are all different examples and way speakers and then uh, people learning new skill. But the, uh, the major, uh, uh, one of the major constituents, the farmers who have been the food providers for the entire world. Um, Gamin yeah, Lina works with farmers. Okay, do you want to tell us about how Bangladesh farmers have been um, able to sell their goods to Japanese markets and uh, how have they been impacted with the COVID pandemic? Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, uh, Professor. Uh, happy birthday. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, uh, my name is Satake. We established a social business company at, uh, 12 years ago to eliminate poverty and malnutrition in the local uh, uh, farmer. And uh, uh, children are living in the slum town. We ex execute two, two projects in uh, Bangladesh. One is uh, introducing Japanese ag agriculture technology for poor farmer. Then uh, we uh, introduce uh, our uh, education uh, for the poor farmer. Then we purchase the uh, products from uh, farmer by uh, affordable, good price, uh, compared with the uh, expense price, uh, uh, compared with the expense uh, market price. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, COVID-19 hampered this project. In spite of this decision, I came to uh, visit the Bangladesh three times in this year uh, to execute this project. Uh, so market is closed. So we uh, couldn't purchase uh, their product. Uh, our target uh, achieved only 50% compared to Pharma. Uh, then uh, there is many obstacles. Uh, also, uh, we uh, eliminated the malnutrition the, for poor children in Slumtown. We delivered a, a very nutritious uh, Ubrena biscuit uh, to uh, 10,000 packets every day. Uh, also, but uh, because of the lockdown, school is closed. Uh, so it uh, hampered our activity. So, but uh, instead of this uh, uh, delivering the biscuit, uh, we deliver this biscuit for the uh, people uh, who live in the slum town. Total 500,000 packets by free. Everything is free. So uh, because so every uh, price is increasing because of the COVID-19, so uh, poor people have become very hungry. So this uh, uh, activity is very so uh, useful and effective for the person who live in the slum town. So uh, still, still uh, we uh, deliver the biscuit to uh, children. Uh, children come to school once a week. Uh, we ask the teacher uh, to persuade the children to pick up the biscuit. Uh, as a result, uh, we deliver the, uh, almost one million packet for children uh, these three months. Uh, such kind of activity is a real social business. Uh, our uh, dream. Mm, thank you. That's very nice to see that you, know, you could still reach out to children with biscuits because they were all hungry. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, how do you, um, um, I mean, you, you manufacture uh, biscuits and then, uh, yeah, I mean, how, when you are going out to distribute, were the people taking it uh, easily or will they? But they're all about uh, scared and what you are giving to them because uh, yes, you're giving uh, it free, right? The uh, resource of the, this profit, uh, we purchase the uh, uh, products from Pharma at good price. Then mm -hmm. we export this product to Japan. Japanese consumer purchase very good price, so we can make a profit. So this such kind of profit used for the uh, social business, like delivering biscuit to introducing Japanese technology. Farmer. So this is our activity. So uh, there is many uh, trouble and also curse for uh, 12 years, but step by step, uh, we continue to achieve our target, supported with the proper science. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's great to know. Uh, so I have, uh, uh, coming back to Sahiti, uh, you had um, 
almost two months, as I know that you did not have revenues at all, you said. Uh, how has the revenues picked up? Has your um, uh, revenues come back now? And what is the status now? Um, so we've come back and how? We, I think um, we're more profitable than we were pre-pandemic because um, as I said, last March, we were finalizing some orders and all of those are in execution right now. And um, luckily for us, these are not monthly projects. These are a multi-year projects that we've been building towards for a couple of years now. So all of those came to fruition. And um, I think uh, we're more profitable now. And as a result of boosted staff morale, they are able to execute much bigger projects than we were used to pre-pandemic. So uh, our revenue numbers are much better now. And uh, we're planning more collaboration with waste because as well, uh, there's a lot of goodwill from their end because of the relief efforts as well. And uh, we, I think, uh, I was just reading Professor Yunus's book today, Morning Banker of the Poor, and I was um, I was stuck by the humility of the book. And then um, uh, one line caught my eye, which I think would apply to all our social businesses, was that instead of assuming what our beneficiaries would require, it really helps to go to their level and then ask them what they require and then work towards providing that. I think um, our uh, relief operations gave us a conduit to do that. And, um, and now that we see they would like to empower themselves um, instead of continuing to receive charity, we we're actively working towards um, enabling them um, to collect more plastic. We're partnering with them to pay advances and then uh, make sure that their business model is elevated and sustainable. Thank you. And I have one question for you. Can you explain a little bit about this ISA model? And how uh, have the students or how have your people who stayed, uh, who are subscribed for ISA model, do they understand this and um, uh, how do they see this? Sure. Uh, we always partner with, with the schools. And so we don't do the ISA by ourselves. We find the schools that are compromised with employability after finishing the courses. So we we speak with students that has done the courses. We we uh, we rank them and see if they are really uh, committed to that. So once we partner with a school that wants to teach something to go to to get a job after that, uh, we help the school with the cred credit score analysis and behavior analysis for the student because uh, for the ISA, ISA model, it, it, really, it is really important that the person that uh, is applying wants to get a job after she or he finishes it because uh, some people studied why some people study isn't for getting a new job. It's just because I want to learn something new and that's okay. But for the ISA model, I need to have some people that wants, wants to get to a new career or to a new job. And then what happens is after we help the school choose the people that uh, fit the model, uh, during the courses, we, we keep uh, close to the students to see if they are enjoying it, if they need something that they don't have in the courses or something like that. But, uh, and during the course, the student doesn't have to pay anything. So uh, make sure you were, apply, you were able to do the course, you are doing the course, you don't have to pay anything. After you finish the course, we, we have a, a platform where you enter every month and tell me, okay, Provi, uh, that's my salary this month. Uh, here in Brazil, we, we talk about in monthly income. Uh, I don't know where everyone uh, are, but here in Brazil, we talk about monthly income. And so every month, the person enters in the platform and tells, okay, my, my income is, I don't know, 2,000 reais. And the minimum for the course is 3,000 reais. So as you are uh, under the minimum, you don't have to pay anything that month. Okay, next month. What's your income? Oh, my income is 2,000 reais again. So you don't pay again. Next month, oh, my income is 3,000 reais. Okay, this month you have to pay a little part, a percentage of that 
3,000 reais. If in the next month you are uh, lower the minimum, you don't have to pay. If you are above the minimum, you, you pay only in that month. And you do that until the end of the contract or until you pay the, 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 the fully price of the course. What happens first? Okay, if I, I, uh, if I go to the end of the contract and I've never uh, got a, a, an income above the minimum, do I have to pay anything? No, you don't, you didn't reach the, uh, how can I say that? You didn't reach the, the, the minimum to start paying so you don't have to pay anything. That's why we at Provi, we need to choose the schools very well. So to the model be uh, profitable and, ex and uh, an opportunity in the future, we have to choose the best courses that are uh, giving the opportunity to go to a, and get a new job above the minimum for the people that are studying. That's how we work in a really fast way. <laughs> Mm. Okay, and that's nice to know. Um, I mean, just uh, I think one question: What has been the uh, major learnings during this last one year? What you had with uh, the former farmers and the students for you uh, in the last one year? Uh, I okay. Mm. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry. No, sorry. Yes. yes. Uh, okay, so uh, actually I learned many things. Uh, in, in spite of this situation, uh, Pharma is very positive. So oh, they uh, try to plant and harvest of our profit. They believe uh, our uh, activity. So for a long time, uh, we contribute uh, uh, for the farmers to increase their income. Uh, but uh, uh, in spite of this situation, uh, market is uh, closed, uh, and uh, we uh, lose the opportunity to purchase their uh, uh, product. But they soon now believe our uh, uh, activity uh, contribution. So I uh, never betrayed their uh, trustee. This is uh, one of the most so important things that I learned from them. Okay. Uh, uh... It was, uh, okay, and just one second. Uh, Saskia, do we have the corporate also in the same one hour? Uh, Prometheus, can you clarify? Is Do we have a few more minutes or? Uh, oh, no, no, we have no, to no, 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 follow after this, Suresh. So you, you're happy to sort of, you've got, I think about five or six minutes left. You, you're okay to finish up and then we can transition over to corporate. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Got it. I just knew that I wasn't sure when we, uh, how much we're pushing because normally we, we are supposed to start now with the second okay. part. I think we, uh, we will try and close it in the next 10 minutes. So uh, Anna, you want to respond to the same question, what's been your learnings uh, and uh, from this last one year? Okay. Sorry, Suresh, five minutes, uh, not, not 10. My apologies. Okay. Okay, my panelists, so you've got one minute to respond. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, I'll, I'll be fast. I think the, 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 the learning that we got during the last year is to adapt to the new situation. So we had to create new products, new ways of payment, and, and it wasn't really planned, it was just, okay, we need to survive, we need to help the schools, we need to uh, help people getting access to education and maybe what we have now isn't enough. What can we do different? And with a lot of pressure and we need to do that fast and create something new to, to help all those people. So I think the, 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 the whole process of adaptation and, and to create new stuff and new things were something that we really learned during the last year. And I think we, we are going to get that for forever at the probably history. Sahiti, what's your learnings? Um, so I've learned that uh, we in social business are incredibly lucky because I've seen many of my friends who are working in the corporate world as software engineers or whatever, whatever. They see so much uh, 
negativity around them and they see so much hopelessness in their jobs as well um, whereas for us uh, and for my uh, partners and in, in, in the network who been working in the social business we can at least take solace in the fact that what we do day to day makes an impact that is very visible to us um, so even though we have faced a lot of struggles i think uh, we face we have seen meaning in our work and uh, we have seen a brighter way forward so uh, my learnings are to persist and adapt i think thank you so we have a couple of minutes is there any questions in any uh, prometheus from your social media sorry i was just just on mute so this is this one yeah. question which is come through and and this sort of transgresses all all the boundaries uh if you were to go back you know a year and a half before the pandemic started what would each of you do differently if you could predict the future okay anyway that would have been my last question so now that somebody has asked so with that we will close maybe which each one of the panelists can take about 30 seconds to respond to that i think we would skimp and save and have an emergency d day fund uh, which would um, see us through at least a couple of months of these kind of scenarios i know i'm thinking about it that that's hard to 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 think i don't know i think uh, we i think if i could come back in time uh, with the knowledge that i have today uh in the first month after march we weren't uh like be holding everything and we would start start to you know uh, continue spending a lot like we were before the pandemic and we we had uh, like a uh, two or three months that we uh we say okay we don't know what will happen let's just survive during those two three months and then we start growing again i think i wouldn't uh stop it for those two or three months because I, I, i don't know that everything is going to be okay thank you okay. you have yeah okay. so regarding the biscuit uh, the, uh, delivery uh, project so we want to establish the online communication communication system with teachers because it's very tough to contact with a uh, student. So if we establish this system, we can deliver the biscuit to the children, not only the uh, school, but also their home. This is our next target. Thank you very much. I think we do have run out of time. So it was so lovely to actually a lot of things which you, everybody wants to share. So Professor, uh, with your permission, I'm going to close the session because we have run out of time in this. So uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to have this session. And uh, uh, I think thanks to Grameen Creative Labs, Unit Social Business, and my lovely panelists to really share uh, all the learnings which they had uh, openly. Thank you very much. With this, Prometheus, I hand it over back to you. Thank you very much, Suresh. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Saheeti. Thank you, Yuka-san. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will very quickly now transition onto the second session of this plenary. which is building a corporate social business i'll hand it over to saskia brastein the ceo co-founder of uno social business and of course the moderator daniel nowak the managing director of corporate innovations at uno social business fantastic promi i'll jump right in here uh, because i know we are a little bit behind time and i want to make sure that we still have some good uh, time with the awesome panelists that Daniel will be moderating. So obviously the first part was with the work that Uno Social Business does at, around um financing and supporting social businesses and now the second part will be the part where we're going to talk about uh, global corporations and what role they can play in building social businesses and what role they can play to actually become a force for good um, eventually over time. um so uh looking at uh the world like how can we actually make corporations become uh, a force for good i mean we're, we're we believe that um to actually go away from the or let's say let me rephrase the sentence again we basically we were talking about no going back the question is where are we going to um and one way to get to a new and better future that is uh, driven by a more inclusive capitalism and social business is through what we call unusual pioneers so people within corporations that say 
we want to change the way that this corporation works. Um, and I think what we've been observing, particularly in the last year, um, but also over the last two years um, more and more, is that there's a trend that corporations are making positive announcements. They're saying, we will be net uh, carbon zero until year so-and-so. Or Larry Fink, the CEO of the largest investor in the world is saying, we're only investing in companies that have a positive purpose. In brackets, there's a lot of greenwashing, a lot of communication, um, and there's not as much action as we would all wish. But at least we see suddenly the rhetoric is changing, which I hope, let's say, being optimistic is the first step before it, um, before actual change. The actual data is that companies are still in the talking mode because if we look at the actual numbers, I believe only less than 1% um, of companies have actually made short-term um, commitments towards uh, lowering their greenhouse gas emissions. I think less than 10% of all uh, global companies have actually set targets for the so-called scope three set of the um, greenhouse uh, gas emissions, which is basically the greenhouse gases that companies emit within their value chain and less than 10%, around about 7% of, uh, um, of boards are actually what they call climate competent. And this is on the climate dimension, which is already anyway, the one that is more advanced uh, in terms of what corporates do. The social dimension, I don't even wanna start talking. Uh, companies are really not even reporting about, uh, you know, uh, human rights violations in their value chain and, um, you know, how bad or not bad they treat employees, et cetera. So just basically, there's still a lot of talk Still very little action, but you know, at least it is moving compared to 10 years ago when I started in this world. So we actually believe that corporate social business can be a way to bridge that gap between the talking, the big commitments and the actual action. We're just saying basically create a social business, dear corporate, that will show you practically what the power of your business could be for society. And humans are, uh, you know, they need examples. Only if they see examples, they actually will be able to make a change. change. Um, we've done some awesome research over the last two years where we've interviewed um, about over 50 corporations that have created social businesses internally. And the good news is that there are all kinds of business benefits um, also that are coming with these types of initiatives, which in brackets is what we need to use to convince the boardrooms that this is something that they should do. Uh, next to obviously the fact that it's actually about serving society, which should, should be the most normal argument, but that's not the argument that the boardroom still listen to. So what we're hearing is that over 70% actually say that this is great for employee motivation and retention. And I think we've heard this um, earlier as well uh, from Zahiti as well in her social business. And also most importantly, 60% say that it changes the mindsets within the companies and they start thinking differently. And I think we've seen this in the example of Emmanuel Faber from Danone, how obviously him creating a social business has over time really changed the way he thinks about the poor, the, the relevance of business. Um, well, and then finally, um, I had mentioned this earlier, we have um, launched a new program together with the World Economic Forum and a number of other players um, uh, that, have, that are supporting social businesses. It's called the Unusual Pioneers. And the Unusual Pioneers are a set of 15 corporate social entrepreneurs within global corporations, including you know, Medtronic, Novartis, Unilever, AXA, et cetera, FIFCO, these are all entrepreneurs within those large corporates that are these unusual pioneers that are actually creating corporate social business examples. And by doing that, helping corporation, the, the corporations themselves to transform for the better. And with that very short and snappy introduction, I will hand over to my awesome uh, colleague, Daniel Novak, who's uh, the managing director of Uno Social Business and running the whole corporate side, who's gonna introduce our very exciting panel and looking forward to the discussion with all of you today. Thanks so much, Saskia. That was uh, quite a concise introduction to what we're doing on our side. Um, and yes, absolutely uh, second the thought that there is a lot of uh, commitment towards uh, changing as a company, towards a force for good. Um, but even if they want to now, there is a lot of uh, challenges around how to make it happen uh, in terms of even capacities, um, um, even beyond willingness, it's really capacities on the corporate side to make it happen, which is why I'm super excited to have uh, the opportunity to be moderating a panel now with um, two examples of those unusual pioneer social entrepreneurs um, that Saskia had mentioned. Um, 
First of all, Saad Arshad, um, who's one of the uh, members, actually, the participants in the Unusual Pioneer Program um, and the head of development finance at Habib Bank, a Pakistani bank um, that is quite interwoven with um, the, the economy and, and Pakistan obviously understands what it means to be um, at, the, at the heart, really, of a society and what that means then when uh, the society is facing challenges. So welcome, Saad. Really looking forward to hearing from you. Um, Takuya Kawamura, and I hope I really haven't butchered your name, I'm um, sorry if, if I did that, but the president of Sun Power Corp, um, actually the, the initiator of a joint venture with Grameen Distribution, focusing on vocational education and services in the mechanics space. Um, really um, looking forward to hearing your story of how you not only have set up a social business, but also transformed Sun Power um, into a quite um, purpose-driven company. And I would just want to start maybe with uh, Saad to share a little bit of a story of, you know, what it is that you're doing with the Habib Bank, specifically when it comes to supporting farmers, smallholder farmers, um, and giving them access to finance and other services. Saad, over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dan, uh, and the rest of the team for this invitation. Um, it's it's an honor to be uh, presenting uh, at this forum in the company of uh, uh, Professor Yunus and uh, other uh, distinguished guests uh, at this forum. Um, as Dan mentioned, I work with the development finance wing of Habib Bank in Pakistan. Um, Habib Bank is the largest commercial bank within the country with the largest rural banking portfolio as well. Uh, the, the amount services to almost 30% of all the rural banking uh, loans are, that are outstanding in Pakistan. So it's a, it's a big chunk. Um, the idea that uh, we have initiated within this organization is uh, driven to improve the livelihoods of local farmers in Pakistan. Um, and the thought process was that um, a normal uh, financial solution for uh, the local farmers either ignore what the basic problems these farmers are facing. And secondly, most of them are also a bit exclude. Ex they exclude a majority of the farmers in Pakistan. As you can see that with, with uh, succession and with the, uh, the new generation coming into the farming families, the land is, uh, is starting to distribute and there are smaller pieces of lands that are owned by individuals. And most of them do not even uh, meet the bar of, low, of the financial needs that a bank has put in, uh, the requirements that the banks currently have to finance these farmers. Um, and when we drill down to the problems that the, these farmers are facing, we can actually categorize into two big buckets. Uh, number one, uh, the, the production rates, the yields of the, the crops that are produced in Pakistan uh, is not comparable to the international standards anymore. Uh, and it's way uh, on the bottom side. Um, uh, a, a few contributors that I can mention here are that one, the farmers, they, they lack access to uh, high quality inputs that goes into growing these crops. Secondly, uh, the, the introduction of latest mechanization uh, and that journey from uh, a manual labor uh, uh, intensive crop production to a latest mechanized crop production has not happened in Pakistan yet. Uh, and that is another reason that the yields are currently very low in the country. And uh, the third factor that we realized was missing was that there is no un, uh, there's no uh, unbiased and fair advisory to, to these farmers because if you look at agronomy, it's now a very scientific field. And most of the farmers that, uh, that practice farming in Pakistan depend on the knowledge that has been passed down from their generations. And um, although that knowledge has been very effective till now, but now we have scientific methods and tools to actually complement those methods. And that, that piece is also still missing uh, in the production side. Uh, secondly, uh, the, the second bucket that I want to talk about um, is that farmers are also uh, not very efficient at selling. Um, and a few factors that contribute towards this inefficient selling is that there's a lot of inefficiencies in the market. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that the, the land holding is reducing in Pakistan. So on average, uh, uh, 
a a, a, a local farmer is uh, is owning about six to seven acres of land. If if you take average of all the farmers and all the cultivable land in Pakistan, and that small chunk of land does not produce enough that can be taken to a bulk processor or a bulk buyer that processes that raw material produced from that farm. So inevitably, all these farmers have to go through a middleman, an aggregator, or a middle market that actually accumulates all these uh, crop produces and then take it to the processing units. Uh, and that is where most of the inefficiencies in Pakistani agriculture value chain lie. The, the middlemen, the middle markets charge exorbitant interest rates uh, to, to these farmers if they are going to them for financing. Secondly, they have a lot of arbitrary deductions uh, in a lot of different heads that the farmer uh, does not even know about. There's, there's a fund for um, a, a construction happening within the mandi, the, the local market. They, they, there's a deduction on the, the baggage that they, they will be using. Uh, and, and a lot of other uh, completely arbitrary deductions. So a lot of efficiencies that the farmer lose out is is happening at these middlemen um, uh, run middle uh, markets. Uh, so these are the two main uh, problems that we identified and we have designed our intervention around these two things. Um, so what what we do under our model of farm to fork solutions uh, housed under the development finance wing is, that we give out in-kind loans to these local farmers. And um, these loans basically pay off to all the inputs, all the latest mechanizations, and all the advisory of the farmers to improve the yield. And secondly, we also connect these farmers with bulk processing units who are on the, the, the customer ledger of the bank. Uh, with an arrangement with these organizations that our finance farmers will go to you, will come to you to sell their produce and you'll have to buy, buy those uh, produce under a certain uh, standard uh, conditions and uh, the, the payment mechanism is also defined. So, so those efficiencies are also reaped when a farmer has direct access to sell his produces. And, uh, so, and, yeah. so you're basically doing ecosystem development and market development. Exactly. In, in one, exactly. In one so it's, it's, it's an integrated value chain that we are creating, which benefits the farmer at the bottom of it and all the organizations who are uh, complementing this value chain by providing inputs, mechanization, and eventually the sellers who are getting high quality produce directly from the farmer rather than from a local, uh, a local uh, marketplace. Awesome. Thanks, Saad. Um, in a minute now, I want to also dive into why Habib Bank is doing this. But I first want to hear a little bit about Takuya. Um, and I share a big thing with you, actually, Takuya. I learned that you started your social business journey really while reading Professor Yunus's book. Um, <laughs> and I think that's something we have in common. Um, I was hooked in the minute I heard Professor Yunus speak back in the day in Wolfsburg, actually, at the Global Social Business Summit. Um, so I then tried to um, track him down. But um, you've done a very interesting thing with um, your company, Sunpower, and actually gotten to a point where you had the chance to um, co-start a, a social business together with Professor Yunus um, and the Grameen Distribution. Can you tell us a bit more about that journey and uh, what that social business is doing? Okay, thank you, Daniel. And thank you, everyone. And also, the uh, before I start, uh, I just want to say happy birthday to Professor Yunus. Thank you for always uh, guiding us. Thank you for always... Uh, teaching us. Thank you for always mentoring us. So thank you so much. And once again, happy birthday, Professor Yunus. Uh, so Daniel, uh, you, you want me to introduce Sampar as a social business company, or you want me to state about my journey uh, uh, since I read the Professor uh, Yunus uh, book? Which Let's quickly go to how it all started and then the, the social business in itself. And then in a second, and then another step, I would love to hear a bit more about uh, what that did to Sampar. Okay, so journey, ne? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I joined Sun Power ten, almost 10 years ago as a successor of the company. But before I was, uh, uh, first I was in Germany and, and also the, I was in the United States. I, I worked in a very big uh, automotive company. And when I worked in the United States, when I was uh, 30 or 31, uh, every, everybody actually was struggling. We had a lot of the talented manager, talented directors or general managers. Uh, 
it seems they have the success of the business, but um, what I saw when I was in the United States was that people are not happy. So I thought that, uh, you know, I'm not specialist to understand why people are not so happy, but I, I, I strongly felt that it, it's something is wrong. And I didn't, I didn't know the reasons behind it. I, I understand it's complex. Again, I was uh, 30 years old and I was very lucky to, uh, to pick up the Professor Muhammad Yunus book. The book title is Create uh, the World Without Poverty. And, 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 I, and I, was, I was very impressed. And also I was very shocked with the ideas and, and the principle of the Professor Muhammad Yunus uh, social business. And that really changed my life. And that's also his book pushed me to think about my life as deeply as possible. And if I look at my company, uh, people work for the shareholders. We didn't work for the customers. We didn't work for, work for our families. We didn't work for our colleagues. We only work for our shareholders. That's, that, that's uh, everybody was forced to do. Um, so because I already read his book and I, his book already changed my life. And after three years, uh, I decided to uh, change my career because I, I already decided to change my life to the social business. So why not I, I, I change the, my, uh, my, my, uh, my business career? Then I started to work at some power uh, since 10 years ago. That's whole starting point of my journey uh, to the social business. Back to that. Awesome. And then how did it go? And tell us a little more, how did the joint venture start? Um, when, what are you doing concretely at the moment? Yes, when I, when, when I joined some power, it, it's a business company. Of course, we did a lot of the good things I believe, but uh, if I, look at my company uh, from now to the 10 years before, Sampa was a business company. So I, uh, I, I started to prepare. I was not head of the company uh, at the beginning of, of course, but I prepared myself to start to change Sampa into the social business company when I become the president. So after three years working at Sampa, uh, I became the head of the company. Then I started to see how I can I can change my company completely into the sort of business company from the business company. So first things I I I I I, I, I did is to change the purpose of my company. And after change my the purpose of my company, it's it's all about the timing. It's three years or five years, or 10 years, all about timing. But most important things from my, in my experience is to define the purpose first of your life, of course, as a leader, but, and then define the purpose of your company as a social business company. That's, that's a starting of the, and I didn't think that I, I was able to meet with the professor Yunus, but life mm -hmm. is funny. Uh, in 2017, uh, I was, it, it was very lucky. Uh, I was able to sit down with the Professor Yunus in Japan. And I made a presentation to Professor Yunus, uh, my, uh, you know, uh, what I want to do, why, blah, blah, blah. Then uh, one year later, this is a fastest uh, speed in my life to set up the overseas launch. But after one year, since I met with a professor Yunus, uh, we launched the Grameen Japan Sampa Award in Bangladesh, uh, uh, providing the service to the local people about the car repair. And we also sell the uh, car parts uh, in Bangladesh. So you're helping people to actually um, get jobs or start their own actual repair shops through vocational education. And some of them I, I saw also are obviously making it to Japan to um, get their education there and bring it back to Bangladesh, right? Yeah, it, it, yes, of course, the, 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 we are a social business company 
if I do the car repair shop, if I do the car uh, uh, used car parts, it's environmentally uh, friendly, uh, less CO2. But at the same time, uh, for some power, it's people are so important. So uh, one of our, uh, the purpose of the existence of some power is to provide a job opportunity. Uh, actually, the 70% of, uh, I'm sorry, 27% of some power employees, I mean, in Japan, are either disabled people or people in a difficult conditions or people have the, having the mental illness. Uh, single mother, there are lots of single mothers in Japan and also the old generation, more than 65 years old. Uh, and the people having the mental problem. Th these type of people, 70% of our total employees are uh, in these people uh, in my country. So wh whatever, the, wh whatever the source of business we do in Japan or overseas, it's important for us to make sure how many disabled people we recruit today? How many mm. people having the mental illness people we recruit today? How many single mothers we recruit? That's very important for the uh, manager of some power uh, uh, reporting to me. And also uh, equally importantly, when we launched the some power, we launched some power social business company, three social business company in Africa right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't recruit a CEO. We don't recruit, uh, you know, the NBA guys over there. We always first recruit the CEO candidates in Japan first, because we want to provide the job opportunities first. And it's important for us to share the discipline and idea of the social business. Then we want to provide the entrepreneurship opportunity to the young generation from the developing countries to start up a Sampa social business company when they return to the uh to the to the countries for example in africa awesome and you're you're on track to actually establish 10 more sun power social businesses i hear in africa by the end of next year so um that's quite you, a powerhouse you're having there you you know you know the sun power better than i know <laughs> that's, oh, that's great if you look yes. at the business purpose uh, it, the, always the purpose is maximize the profit maximize the look a footprint yeah. They want to make a company the bigger and beautiful, but for the social business company, it's, it's, it's not. Uh, the, the, why we set up the 10 social business company in Africa by end of the next year is because yeah. we want to create 10 entrepreneurs in Africa. Awesome. And I think that's great to see um, that, you know, you're really figuring out that uh, your role in society, your role in, uh, in this world in a very positive way beyond shareholder value. And uh, maybe then over, over to Saad, because um, you haven't yet made it to become the CEO or president of Happy Bank. I think you're still a year or two out. But um, that being said, there is a specific reason, obviously, why Happy Bank is doing what it is doing and uh, why it lets you uh, work with smallholder farmers in Pakistan. I would really love to understand what that motivation is and specifically also what can, you know, the big global corporates obviously learn from that, um, you know, that's integration to society. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, well, I, well, you see that uh, banks are the economic drivers of any country. Um, it's just that most of them don't realize this role. Um, so any sector that a, a large bank invests in, that's, that is bound to grow. Um, so there, there, there are two, uh, you, can, you can categorize the, the reasons to, uh, to invest in agriculture into two big buckets. Um, one is that, of course, uh, once uh, you... Once, uh, if you look at the business side, if if if, if an organization has captured all, all the businesses uh, in its country, then um, the it's obviously saturated. Um, and since agriculture is one of the the largest untapped market in Pakistan, um, it, it's a very easy business case study for any organization to invest in. And I'm I'm leading from a business. Um, uh, argument towards justifying its investment is because um, because that's that's I, I I think that's the approach that all business organizations should take that they should 
they should be cognizant enough of of the sectors that that needs to grow in order to bring their country and their population to a certain level um and and that's what agriculture is to pakistan um it contributes independently almost around 20% to the gdp and if you take the cumulative effect it easily crosses 50% and still no nobody is willing to invest in in agriculture so so i guess there's a there's a great business case to invest in it and secondly uh, the vision for hbl is to enable dreams among among the people um and uh, just following that mission um hbl is is trying to make this product also in, inclusive enough that it caters to all the deserving farmers out there i'll i'll give you a quick example so majority of the farmers in pakistan um they they um they have small lands as i established before but a, a, a big chunk of them also do not own land they have rather uh, leased lands from big land owners and then they farm on it and no commercial bank has a product that can cater to such farmers who do not have their own lands because then they don't have any collateral or security to get to that financing against um but under our model um we clearly have a provision that the the product needs to go to those fa- farmers as well just to be inclusive so that farmers who do not have access to any uh, regular financing in the country should also is in are included into the financial net of of uh, this this service that we are we are providing um and just to uh, implement just to have a target on it we have set a 70 30% split to start with that we'll definitely provide 30% loans to those farmers who do not have land are and are excluded from uh, the regular financial uh, benefits from other banks um and that's that's uh, that has actually uh been one of the major contributors of uh farmers actually accepting the product because um it's actually targeted towards their needs um and once you've realized what what the target audience actually needs then it's very easy to satisfy your customer right um so so yeah it's it's a it's a great balance between a, a good business case and uh uh a sector and uh, a, a a section of the population that really needs big corporates and organizations to invest and work on them just to uplift these sectors and eventually uplift the whole country right and hopefully then maybe if you over the course of the program um, we will also see opportunities to actually establish a separate uh, social business with happy bank so that's my secret mission here that we can Perfect. next time that we meet with professor yunus we set up a, a separate entity as a social <laughs> business that does just that focuses on the 30% you just mentioned that would be great that would um, be awesome i know that we're getting at the end of the time but i wanted to ask one last question to the two of you um since uh, you know we're we're t- in my notes of bad mention this morning that um we do need entrepreneurs like you you know others call it the fire souls inside of the companies to really change them inside out i think takuya's journey was was quite um, impressive uh, you know all the way to uh, reestablishing the purpose of the company um i think a, lo- a lot of people are listening in now coming from those corporates that actually one of the entrepreneurs i think it was uh, sahiti um talked about that it seems seems a bit gloomy when you're inside of a big corporation to actually um do work that matters uh, day in and day out so would love to hear from the two of you maybe this time uh, starting with uh, sad and then ending with takuya um what are the the one or two or maximum three things that you would tell anybody working in a corporation how can they get started on social business outside of a company even if they're not the president uh, uh dan just just a clarification question uh, uh does the advice have to go to people who are working at corporates or who are just looking for uh social impact work well i think the interesting part here is what what can you do outside of a corporate right and and as as an employee in a corporate um, in a corporate environment so we'd love to okay. do that right um so so i think um one needs to have a clarity of um of of their professional vision uh what they want to do at the end of the day um so 
my drivers of my professional work are always um, geared by social impact uh, and com uh, complemented by uh, building new things and uh, solving global problems. Um, so that's that's how I steer my journey. So I'm, I have clarity of uh, my professional vision. I think that's something that um, any professional has to have a, 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 to focus their energies um, on, on their path. Even if it's not social impact, um, they need to have a clarity of vision. Um, and, uh, and secondly, uh, I, I think it also depends on uh, um, how, how you look at the broader society because so uh, if you're working in a corporate organization uh, with, with no uh, social uh, or um, any impact that, that you see, you, 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 you're living in, in a bubble that, that you, you are contributing to the success of an organization, uh, but you're not looking at the, the broader picture of the impact of that organization. So for me, every business solves a problem. It's just the framework that you have to put in that how that problem can can have such an impact that can actually boost the 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 the, the livelihoods of the society as well, right? Um, so the same thing can can be uh, contextualized around banks. Uh, a bank is a, a, a corporate organization, but if if you look at the benefits, it's it's actually a driver of the of the whole economy. It can invest in any sector that needs to be uplifted. So it's it's the right framework that you also needs to bring in. Uh, to your work, so you can you can actually see uh, where you can add value in in terms of social impact as well, rather than just solving uh, problems for uh, for your organization. Awesome, thanks. I think this speaks also to Takuya's point on having your own purpose clear, which is quite important, I would say. Um, so Takuya, how would you say um, does one become a social entrepreneur? How does one start a corporate social business? I guess it all starts with uh, reading Professor Yunus's recent book, right? Yeah, my, from my experience, I have uh, two comments. Uh, those who want to uh, do the social business and uh, changing your company. The first, because social business, like I said, uh, it's all about your, your life. So first, what you have to do is to define your purpose of your life as deeply as possible until you are clearly convinced. So set up the purpose for your life first, and then, uh, if we, you know, uh, Professor Yunus always told us, uh, tells us that uh, uh, if we want to launch a social business, don't think big, yeah? Start from the tiny business, start from the small step. So it, it's sent to you uh, as uh, employees. So don't, don't think, you know, you know, big thing at the beginning. Once you're convinced that purpose of your life is to go to the journey with social business, then it's all set, it's done, it's a matter of time. 10 years, three, three years, two years, it's a matter of time. So start from the tiny things you can do from the tomorrow, not from the 10 years. Start from the something as small as possible, which you can do from tomorrow. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Takuya. And uh, I'm looking to our timekeepers. If we do have more time for uh, questions, um, um, if we do have any time left, then we can ask uh, some questions from the audience. Otherwise, we'll hand over to the next session. It's just uh, one question which has come through. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, I, I leave it to you, Daniel, to address or any of the other panelists. Is uh, This is reflecting on what's been uh, said by uh, Gao Murasan and then partially by Saad as well. And of course, uh, Saskia's presentation. How do we truly start holding corporates accountable mm -hmm towards their social responsibilities. And, and there are legislative aspects to it. There are also, of course, governance aspects to it, but how do we truly hold them accountable? Yeah, I think that's a large, uh, large conversation to be had, to be honest. I'm not sure if there's a short answer. Saad and Takuya, do you have a short answer for it? You mean a difference between CSR versus social business? Yeah, I think more the, the accountability, like if, the, if so many companies are now committing to become a force for good, either um, you know, contribute to society or contribute positively to climate change, how can we hold them accountable that they actually follow through on that? Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't catch the point of the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just, um, I think 
you know, when when you have a company that is trying, that is uh, are communicating that is it is doing good, um, how do you actually check that it is doing good? Because obviously they could just be saying that. Okay, I, yeah, I, I think it's very simple. Check the check the company's uh, uh, regulation or company. I don't know how to say in English. Mm -hmm. Governance and framework. So, social business. If the if the, the the company does a good things, really at a social business purpose. The, when when you look at the, the company, it's clearly stated the purpose of the company. For for the other all the other things, the CSR is doing the good thing, at the purpose of the maximizing the financial profits. Yeah. Hmm. Thanks, Takuya. And Sat, yeah, Sat, do you have a view? Um, yeah, uh, Dan, I, I think. Um... So legislations and policy prescriptions are one way to go about it. Um, that can definitely influence any corporate organization, um, like getting some buy-in from the government and the frameworks that drive corporates in any country. Uh, but secondly, uh, I, I think that um, if you want to bring bring about change, you cannot do it forcefully. I, I think it has to be organic, right? Um, so. Uh, Building up on uh, Takuya's point, maybe maybe the governance structures within the organizations need to change. Maybe the the advocacy uh, needs to come from from the journal public of being more than just corporate organizations and doing more for for the customers who are who will actually be paying for for the services that they're providing. So so there's this argument that we we always use that. Uh, all these big corporates, they have, they've created multiple products and services for, for the masses in Pakistan. But how will the masses going to be, uh, will be affording those products and services when they don't have any money? So you have to, you have to empower uh, the, the target customer as well. And so, so the push should also, one, it, it should come from the government, but it's also come from, from the beneficiaries of these corporate organizations that, Guys, you need to do more than just sell us products and services. Yeah. And let me maybe end on that because I, I really want to harm on that. We've been talking a lot with uh, on corporate accountability frameworks and there's something in the infinity loop of so many stakeholders that work together to hold companies ac accountable in the future and then also hold them accountable to their commitment to social business as much as their account, their commitments to climate change and social uh, equality. And it, it does need that broad stakeholder group. It does need regulation. It does need more transparency on the reporting, self-reporting of companies. But then also you need the activists. You need the journalists that uncover things um, that, I, that otherwise keep hidden. Um, you, you, now also we're talking about technology, satellite technology that's actually um, taking the footprint, carbon footprint of companies at their production sites. So we no longer just have to rely on their uh, self-reported uh, CO2 emissions. Um, we have, you know, um, accountability frameworks, reporting frameworks that are now more and more emerging, becoming more important. The financial markets have uh, are playing an increasing role. So I think all of that, I think, is super important for accountability in the, in the future. It's a big, big puzzle, I would say. Um, I think at the essence and at the core is something that, you know, takes us back to what Professor Jonas has been saying is, who are we as people? You know, what is our social consciousness? What is, what is our purpose? And how are we acting on that and holding our own employers um, accountable to it? How do we act on it to start our own social businesses? So I think that's uh, super relevant to take us forward in terms of rethinking how we think about the purpose of business. And thanks for the timekeeping. Thank Last you point, very maybe, much. Thank you, Takuya, and thank you, Sad, for the very interesting conversation. Thanks so thank much. Thank you so much. Uh, if if uh, we've had the pleasure of having uh, Professor Yunus listen in on this conversation, so sir, if you wouldn't mind weighing in just for a minute about any reflections that you may have on the discussions we've had in this plenary. Uh, sir, uh, you're on mute, sir. There's so much. Uh, I was just listening uh, to see what's going on, what the thing is. Uh, this is a good occasion to listen and find out uh, what is uh, along, what is happening uh, in different various ways of uh, our expression, of our ideas and so on. So this is a good uh, presentation from all three of you, from Saskia, from Saad and uh, Takuya. Uh, each one has uh, 
experience from their own concrete work. And um, this is an occasion to uh, exchange those experiences. So each one is very valuable. That's all I'll say. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again, Daniel, Saad, uh, Kaumura, Sun, and of course, Saskia. We deeply appreciate your contributions towards the conference. Uh, with this, uh, we draw a close to uh, the second plenary, which is no going back. What does a post-pandemic economy look like? Uh, which gets us to uh, the next plenary session, which is which has perhaps been one of the most significant topics that we will be covering throughout the course of uh, these five days. Obviously, all the sessions that we cover are, are equally important, but this is very timely. And I think uh, it would be good to address the uh, issue, which is the global pharma social business. Now, with the theme of no going back, uh, this panel aims to start a conversation on how social business can help address global inequalities in health in a post-pandemic world, going deep into the details of how a social business around global pharma can be created. Uh, and, and many discussions have been had with students, many reflections have been had, which will all be sort of put together uh, by the moderator. And at this, as we start, uh, again, uh, we would just, uh, again, we have the pleasure of having Professor Yunus listen in on this. And at the end of the session, we will of course request Professor Yunus to give a few of his thoughts. But right now, I think I must hand it over to the man of the hour, which is Hans Reitz, CEO, of the Grameen Creative Labs who'd be moderating the session. Hans, I request you to take over and of course, introduce your speakers as well. Thank you, Hans. Thank you, my friend. Hello again. Uh, what's a great business day. So let's see, let's start directly with the challenge. We prepared a small uh, presentation. We will go point by point to be really shaped, be really reflected how we want to do this. And Maria, if you can be so friendly to change uh, to, to exchange the presentations, and then we will come first and first. First First of all, that was a clear target on the way to say how we can do it. It was a very open problem. You know, we always say, come and bring all your problems. And on the Global Pharma Social Business uh, Project, it was very clear uh, this problem is uh, really broad. So what we did is we took the targets. We say, okay, the initial situation is COVID-19 is not the last health challenge of the world will face. We will need to prepare ahead for the next health crisis and ensure access to healthcare for all, regardless of class, race, ethnic, or gender. We propose to form a global pharma and social business uh, company powered by an alliance of leaders, empaths, and innovators who wish to make the difference in the world while doing social business with the mission of an ensuring equal dignity in medicine care. And the equal dignity in medicine care, this is a core what we would like to do by transforming and shaping the pharma businesses. So this is the initial situation. If we see the next aspect, how we go a little bit closer is the general challenges. What are the challenges of the global health in the global south? How many people have access to health services in the global south? What are the existing healthcare financing models on the global south? That's what's the first question is what's come in our mind. Then we talk to specialists and the next slides we see the specialist questions what we have. And this is the way of a global pharma social business model. The procurement, the distribution, the medicines, many uh, payment models, the evaluation, many unknown areas, because we are not pharmacy, we are not the best uh, uh, knowledge driver so far, so we have to bring it together. And of course, at the end, the result should be a global pharma social business, at least as a model. In the next chart, we see the countries from the Human Development Index, who are really the most countries in the best needs, in the most social needs. And of course, we saw the zone uh, uh, in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, as a very much uh, 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 from the quantity of the people we see on the research, clearly on the data really here. We see it in the Central Africa in a big way, and we see it in uh, north, uh, the north part of South America and uh, the Central American aspect as the main focus. I guess after seeing so many stuff now in every country, this will be needed, but this is where the poorest and where data give us a clear sign to do so. In the next step, is uh, the countries and focus on the life expectancy on 2019. We see a similar map. So if we want to focus to hit the most uh, uh, 
uh, uh, people impressing needs. That's are the areas where data tell us very clear. Here we can make the first and deepest need in it. As more we did on the research and on the stuff about the focus uh, on the problem, is we see in the next uh, slides, is uh, the criteria of drug selections, the patent protection still existing, the most important test cases, the manageability on the storage on the health and on the um, on the practical way how to bring it, effective relationships between therapy success and costs, easy and broad application. Later on, I really love to have a woman of praxis with us who explain everything. In the next uh, uh, level, the numbers of the deaths by cost by the world 2017. If you look to this data later on, really it shows we can do a lot with pharmacy uh, uh, aspect, but still it will be a way of how we living the most impact what we can do, but that doesn't ignore the necessary of a social business pharma company. The next slide please, Maria. Uh, the diseases, uh, and that's what we say, stay with the problem. The diseases are what we have, at least at the moment, is still malaria, tuberculosis, diabetes, respiratory infects, the maternal morality, hepatitis P, HIV and AIDS, malaria, neonatal disorders. And that's are clear the diseases where it's the complexity where we can start the, the easily uh, the, the success of a, of, of a global social business pharma company. And uh, our last slide is, um, before we go on the brainstorming, please go back to the camera so we can introduce our guests uh, how we are doing it. In the very beginning, uh, we just start to talk and uh, the first thing is what we addressed after Professor Yunus was a man who is in the practical pharma industry, a man who is there more than 25 years. And Harald, it's a great honor for me to welcome you now here and to talk in the next 10 minutes on your perspective on all this. On your background, I, I meet you at this moment, you was the CEO of the social business inside Novartis. Today, you have a new position, but your heart is very deeply into social business. What you can see, social business, our concept, our role model can play a game changer in the pharma industry. Thank you, Hans, um, and, and hello, everybody. I truly enjoyed uh, speaking with the, with the young physicians um, end of last week um, for for a good um, for a good time, and I I value all the questions and all the challenges that you've just brought forward, Hans, and that um, the team also brought in front of me, and of course uh, there wasn't possibly the time to look into all those aspects. Um, I, let me start with the with the final recommendation I gave to to the team, and then elaborate a little bit on why I did this. So my, my recommendation consisted of two parts. Um, one part is just um, start, start anywhere. It doesn't really matter. As long as you start, start small and learn fast. Um, the, the, the implementation, irrespective of what the team does, will be so complex um, that, that it's going to require a high agility and willingness to learn and to collaborate also with other organizations. And the, the second most important criterion is um, <clears throat> to, um, to question even the status quo of how global health currently is being delivered. Uh, you mentioned the disease areas just now, and you men mentioned uh, key essential medicines, and you've mentioned um, the, the disease burden uh, and where it is the biggest. I guess we fundamentally need to question the way we think. Because what we at the moment also in the highly developed countries do not value and do not value enough is the value of health. Um, we, we don't focus on prevention. Uh, there is no value tech or price tech, if you wish, to proper prevention, um, healthy nutrition, um, exercising. This is all completely undervalued, even in our high developed societies. And it is by far the biggest bang for the buck, um, also acknowledged by WHO and many other organizations. So, so finding ways, and this is the second component, finding ways to um, not just question the status quo in terms of by simply questioning it and by, um, and by agitating against the status quo, but um, trying to convince established thinking by tagging values to health outcomes. Um, 
so this is this is my my basic um, thought process towards social business. And then there are various options for social business. Um, and in your uh, slide deck, you alluded to this already, Hans. Um, you could, of course, try to replicate a pharmaceutical companies or a generic manufacturer and try to provide um, generic medicines or essential medicines. Questionable though, whether they could become at better price points. And what has what many research has been showing, it's not about price. Price is an important component, agreeable, but it's not the only one. Just to give you an example, and this is also, it has been in your slide deck, tenofovir, for example, it's a drug originally developed by the uh, organization I'm now working for, Gilead Sciences. However, through <clears throat> making this medicine available um, to, to voluntary licensing partners on one hand and now also to the generic industry, um, an annual treatment course of this medicine is available for $32. This is, this is even affordable to the second lowest wealth quintile in the world. However, people are not on viral load suppression with this medicine. And there are many reasons for this. So when, when establishing a global pharmacy or social business approach, um, you can almost start anywhere. You can look at the medicines, but as you've mentioned, there are six main building blocks um, acknowledged by WHO to strengthen the health system. Medicines and service supply is one. Technical support is another one. From my humble perspective, having worked in this field for quite some time now, is what is needed the most um, is two things. One thing is domestic ownership and sponsorship. So the accountability needs to sit with the government of a recipient country. They need to take the ownership and appreciate the ownership um, and ask questions towards universal health coverage, such as, um, how to increase the health benefit package. So which me medicines and services should be forming part of this benefit package? Second question is how to increase population coverage. So who's the next one to benefit from that benefit package? And last but not least, leaving no one behind in financial terms, um, how to move from an out-of-pocket model to a prepayment model. Um, and here, and here, many things could be looked at. Um, let me mm -hmm. let me just um, finish my my initial impulse off by saying the way and and again questioning the status quo. It's not so much about strengthening the traditional therapy verticals supported by the Global Fund, for example. Yes, malaria, tuberculosis, um, HIV are very um, very problematic premature killers. Even more so, and also part of your slides, is hypertension and the consequences of hypertension. But if we, if we just come with different vertical interventions, we will overload the system. We've, we will be perceived as the solution providers, the seemingly solution providers from the global north, superimposing our technical solutions onto communities. What is needed the most, um, because pandemics start and are ended at community level, is to look horizontally from a, from a people's perspective. In the end, we treat people and not diseases. Therefore, showcasing and, and value tagging, something could be a good starting point now, um, showcasing synergistic implementation around anti, antenatal and postnatal care, for example, um, bridging there for maternal and child health, um, Children die of diarrhea, they die prematurely of malaria, they die because of the complications of sickle cell disease. Um, linking this potentially with nutrition, with family planning, um, with, uh, with empowering female health workers and midwives, looking into um, prevention of maternal to child transmission and an early vaccination. All this is around um, the newborn, it's, uh, it's around the, the third trimester. Uh, during pregnancy. Therefore, therefore, what needs to be in place and what needs to properly coordinate it, and here the private sector can bring a lot, is um, awareness creation, prevention of stigma or overcoming of stigma. Um, it is early diagnosis and testing and then uh, appropriate treatment, which are 
available to a, to a good degree already. So yeah. that link to care is important. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, super. Thanks, Harold. So all what you tell us is there is enough things to take care. We can do it, but in the same moment, uh, of course, there's often the way don't think so big, um, start small as well as somebody don't think so big, think bigger. That's also the new attitude of the social aspects, you know. So imagine in five years, we would have enough raised money, billions of dollars to invest and be the new Pfizer, you know, be the new, the new company who can do it, you know, who can make it, who have the technology. I know Professor Yunus is dreaming on when this is not under control only of the speculative market. It's a non-speculative market. So you as one of the top manager in the pharmacy and one of a bit of a heart like an elephant, uh, if you see the target of creating a pharma uh, company and, and after you, we will talk with Barbara. She is a nursing since decades and will tell us a lot about the practical thing. But could you imagine to say, if we would have five billion dollars, start tomorrow, getting the right CEOs all, and say we create a counterculture in the pharmacy, just as an example to be bold enough. Uh, can we do it? Um, you need the right people. You need to acquire um, capabilities for this. You could uh, you could do a lot with that. You could not solve um, because in the end, the triage between government, civil society, and the private sector needs to be in place. And if it, if it was that easy, believe me, although they don't come across usually like that, but many pharma uh, top executives would do um, a much bigger step if it was just um, more obvious what to do and, and how to go about it. In the end, nothing replaces local ownership of local governments. This is the most important one. And yes, you could do a lot. Um, you could, for example, also support um, the, the intrapreneurial activities, which are represented, for example, through me or through some other colleagues in different other organizations. But you wouldn't solve it. You wouldn't uh, automatically bring down, um, for example, the mortality in malaria. Because, I mean, we, we have the drugs are available. They are affordable to governments, at least they're provided by the Global Fund. But the children... They die in DRC and they, they die upstate Nigeria. And so far, the, the community strengthening in those areas has not happened. And this is usually um, done by the local uh, female health workers or, I mean, strengthening those the, because those services are absolutely key and they are not going to be provided by any private sector organization. They simply can't. Yeah, yeah I, I, I completely follow you because also with um, one uh, renewable energy, you can't solve the whole energy sector. The same is here. But if we would have and to create the global social business pharmacy and is it $1 billion investment enough, maybe $5 billion? So what's are the, the real amount of money to say we can hire the best people, we can start and we can be on an eye level with research and stuff as one player inside the global pharma market. So, so from my perspective, what will not be needed is the traditional private sector pharmaceuticals research. Um, given that the incentive structures pay, uh, stay the same, this will always be available and would be anyway too costly. What is needed is implementation research, understanding why is the poorest wealth stratum paying the most, even in absolute terms, for affordable in principle, affordable medicines. Um, really providing data, making data public good from an equity lens, and then steering and adapting the interventions according to those data. This is important. And yes, with a billion, you can for sure um, better implement um, anti-malarial interventions in DSC in upstate Nigeria. You can nicely link this also with um, perinatal um, programming around other diseases. Yes, you can. Okay, let's go for it, Harald. I think we also started with the plastic lab is, uh, five years ago and everybody was smiling to put the billion together. It's not the problem at the end. It's a question of time. Mm -hmm. We need people like you because we have no clue about pharmacy and, uh, and the idea and Professor Yunus now want to do this also in Bangladesh. So we are very happy when you on, on somehow guide us and uh, Thanks a lot for your time. And I know this is out of your personal interest. It's your personal purpose to do though. We will follow your personal purpose and we are happy to be connected with one of the top managers 
and really understand social business and the model and love it since many years. It's a real pleasure for me to, to know you as a, a walking on the same path. And I felt when Professor Yunus asked me, that's really in the bottom of his heart to be done now and not wait too long, because it's really something where we see now how shameful we behave as a system. But how great we can behave, that shows us Barbara. And Barbara, when I, and I pass over now, uh, Harald, to Barbara. Barbara, when I meet you the first time, you know, I'm working now 12 years in the field of social business and I saw so many projects. But my last one, of course, is the one of the nursing school, the one how you uh, precisely implement it, how you educate the next nurses. And we, we, I learned from you and Professor Yunus, and we had uh, uh, one doc, uh, three nurses, one doctor, and we had a completely irrational relationship on how we educate nurses. So you're a woman and a person on praxis. When Professor Yunus comes to me and says, Hans, let's create this. And I, I also push it in the way, say, yes, let's do it. I say, one idea could be, we have the Red Cross, we have the, we have the Doctors Without Borders, we have Professor Mukrewe, and we have the Yunus family. If all the four organizations get weaved together and say, that has to be done now, that was one of the ideas. So why not to go to the founders and to the management uh, responsible to Doctors Without Borders, to the great organization Red Cross and Halt Moon, to the Mukrewe, and say, we all team up and see how we can make it happen and say, we only need a billion dollar to start. A one billion dollar, we will do it, we will make it, we take care, we take the governance, we take the shareholder, we will guide it as a social business. Your woman as a praxis, is it doable or is it just a dream? Oh, you are on, you have to, the microphone. Sorry about that, I was mute. No, 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 we, I mean, we that, all that, that, this. That, that's a huge question, Hans, and hello, everybody, and nice to be invited to join you, although with such, um, you know, esteemed people, I'm not sure that um, my practical knowledge is going to be a lot of a contribution, but I'll try my best. Um, when I was looking at your concept paper and, and thinking this through, I mean, it was easy to get distracted into very technical solutions and think up, up on the top. And then I thought, no, no, that's not what's needed. I need to think about this from a very practical, on the ground perspective, because that's where I come from in terms of actually delivering um, care on, on, right on the front in the rural areas. You know, that was my background as a nurse midwife in the middle of nowhere in Afghanistan, Bhutan, with no doctors and me and one other nurse and, you know, lots of patients every day and having to deal with it. Now that's a long time ago, but what saddens me is that things haven't changed a lot in a lot of places. And I went back to the, the, um, the call in primary health care, the three key pillars of accessibility, availability, and affordability. And I thought, you know what, this is the problem. These things have not been achieved either by the pharmaceutical societies and companies or by governments. There are very many people who don't have healthcare easily available to them. Women are still traveling several days to get to a clinic when they're in labor. People are still sick and, and don't go to the health clinic because it's too far away. There are no buses, or if there are, they're only once a week. You know, they have no transport or they don't have the money to buy it. So having access to health care and health, primary health care units and hospitals is still for many, many people a major challenge. And accessibility, even when they get there, often they don't have the ability to access the kind of care that they need. Most of these primary health care centers um, have health care workers who can do very basic stuff, but they don't have the ability to diagnose adequately. There are no laboratories there. There are no chemicals available. Um, their drug supply is limited, and even though it should be the essential drug supply, often it's not, and it ends up as being essentially um, antibiotics, um, uh, analgesics, and um, oral rehydration. 
and and that's the end of it. That that's probably what they have because the supply is non-existent or it's very poorly um, provided for. Because, like you said, um, like Harold said, they they don't. There's no priority given to primary health care, and if you don't equip. Um, the centres where the care is being given, however good your pharmaceutical societies are, if they don't reach the end point, um, there's no, it's a waste of time because most, 70% of, of the poorer population need that facility to be able to get their health care. They can't go into the cities because they can't afford it. They can't get there. They can't stay there when they get there. Even if the actual care were free, the cost of travel, the cost of being there, the cost of getting away. And often, I have to say, the cost of buying your way through the system because of corruption um, is a major, major barrier. And, and that, that can be extremely difficult for them. So the infrastructure isn't there to, to assist them. The, um, often the drugs aren't there, the facilities aren't there. And the thing that's very dear to my heart is that if we, and again, I think this reflects something that Harold's saying, if we really want to make a difference, we've got to get out of the silo mentality. We've got to move from, we're gonna treat malaria, we're gonna treat this, we're gonna treat that. We have got to think comprehensively. We have to train both our doctors and our nurses to think comprehensively, to think within teams. One of the big barriers in the developing world to effective healthcare delivery is because doctors still believe that they are the only providers. They see them still see themselves in many cases as mini gods. And your, your healthcare workers, your healthcare assistants are not adequately educated, trained, or prepared to do what's necessary. And they, they need to be. We need to have highly skilled um, practitioners, um, healthcare practitioners out there. They don't have to be doctors. And my own experience, and I'm sure some of you will be able to reflect this, is that most doctors, a lot of doctors, don't want um, to work in rural areas because they have families. They want their children to go to a decent school. They want to be able to do some private practice. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of reasons why they're not out there. But the people who are out there are getting a three month training. They can't do minor surgery. They can't even do anything that's life saving. And your skilled birth attendants can do so much. But often it's not about that they couldn't do it, but they're not licensed to do it. They don't have the permission. And if they do risk it, then there's trouble. I still remember training family health care nurses in Tajikistan. And one woman told me, one of these women told me, she said, the woman was dying from an obstructed labor, but I didn't dare interfere because if I had interfered, I could have been actually taken to jail and accused um, for stepping out of my uh, scope of practice. And she I couldn't risk it. And, you know, we have to think about people. We've got to rethink the whole medical team. If you really want to deliver an effective pharmaceutical, you know, business, we've got to think through who's doing it, how it's funded. So we need good insurance schemes, like, like was just said, people pay up ahead small amounts and we have in place an insurance scheme that they can afford and that will cover the costs. And we need to have well-equipped health centers that have um, capacity for some surgery. Um, it doesn't have to be the major, major stuff, but certainly life-saving um, interventions. And, and we have to introduce a lot more telemedicine. Why not a hub with the doctors in? And then, you know, your practitioners out there who can transfer, you know, um, some x-rays and tests and things all can be done on the phone. We had discussions about this when I was in, in Bangladesh that, um, you know, maybe there were companies who were coming in with, with um, apps that could actually do an ultrasound on a woman. And then that could be sent to 
um, a telehub where there was an obstetrician who could look at the ultrasound and then send back advice to the midwife on what she should be doing. This teamwork, I, I think we've got to think differently. We've got to use technology and we've got to get the best care out there away from the centralized hospitals. And then your, your, your drugs, um, your chemicals for lab tests, um, all of these things will be made available. So I'm a great believer in training and education, a new generation of healthcare workers. Let's sweep away the current curricula. If you look at the curricula, they're totally, nurses spend 50% of the time learning anatomy and physiology. They do not need to know the structure of a muscle to give an injection, but they do know how to communicate. They do need to know how to communicate with patients, how to persuade them to take the injection how to convince them and give them reassurance. They need good communication skills, not some, you know, vague, um, you know, cellular biology, which is totally irrelevant, but that's still in the curriculum. What nonsense is that? You know, not the practice stuff. And the tele, I suggest the tele mentioned health education, health promotion, persuading people. Um, I did a project in, in South Africa up on the borders of Limpopo, river, um, you know, between, um, uh, what's it called? Not, I was going to say Rhodesia, but that's wrong. <laughs> Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe in South Africa. And we were training community nurses to recognize club foot and hair lip in the early stages. And you say to yourself, well, any doctor could do that. Anybody could do that. Yeah, of course they could. But what you've got to take into account is that the mothers hide these babies. They don't let you see them until it's too late to make a good intervention. And the baby, by the time it gets to have its hair lip corrected, is too old. It's five and six, and it already has long-term problems with speech and language communication. The same with club foot. There's too much damage, whereas if you do it within the first three months, you can correct it. And we were trying to teach these community nurses, whenever you see a baby, unwrap it and look at it. Simple, simple procedures, but makes a huge difference. Um, I've probably said enough, but um, I would endorse a lot of the things no. that I've said. But, uh, you know, these are the things that are on my heart. And I would like to see a big change in terms of how we think about and how we deliver health care, particularly to these remote areas. Thank you, Barbara. You know, I couldn't listen forever because it's so <laughs> real. It's so, so we love you for your passion and your practical sense. So to give you feedback, so it means if we started, don't think big, think bigger. Start your pharmaceutical company, but build a global social business fund for healthcare, put five billion in and make it holistic and turn it around. We have to do properly our pharmacy aspect because if we don't do yeah. this, our mindset, we always will dependent on the drop on the pharmacy colleagues. I, I love Professor Yunus' uh, vision to say, let's do it because we, we also did Grameen Phone. We also did a lot of different stuff. So let's enter this unknown of unknown market and be in this pharma business with an example. And then of course, do bolder, take care about each other. It's about education. It's about the holistic movement. And of course, nothing more teach us than uh, this virus about self-responsibility of health Take yeah. your own responsibility for your health. Give people the knowledge of uh, uh, Tokuma, of, of many things and how to live a healthy life. So it's all one way. There's no uh, organization better known like the, the, the Grameen family who are really can do it village by village. So let's keep on this discussion, Barbara, how we can build this global social business fund for health, how we create this money, how we can have the five billion and how we can unite the most renewable um, organizations. Say, let's follow a social business model. Today, we celebrate the social business model. And that's why we invite all of you. Yeah. Yeah, of is, um, yeah. I do think, and, can I just add one thing, Hans? One absolutely. thing I didn't mention, which is important. Um, maybe we have to think too about the outlets for selling um, drugs. Because as you know, and as I know, many, many patients, many people in the developing world do go and buy their own drugs because they can't afford to go to a doctor and they self-medicate. Now, yeah. you know, maybe we, instead of condemning that, we should in somehow 
build on it, maybe train the pharmacists better, maybe make sure that the drugs that are produced are not contaminated or false so that people are buying what they think is an antibiotic, but it's actually, you know, coffee powder or something. Um, you know, I think here's, here's a whole area that we could focus on. New outlets, trustworthy outlets with pharma, pharmacy um, staff who know what they're talking about, who are trained and who can educate and give advice to people as well. Um, I mean, it's, it's a starting point right at the beginning. And if you could invest in that kind of outlet and good drugs, I think that in itself would make a huge difference. Absolutely, Barbara. We rec God thanks, we record everything so we can write it down, <laughs> everything <laughs> what you just said. This is I'm not sure. beautiful. Yeah. So we, we, we are really uh, 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 take it serious, our discussion now on creativity, how to shape it. We are all here today because we want to celebrate the happy, happy social business model. We want to really say, this is a model who could make a game shape. And that brings me to my next friend, the next part, a new friend, Walter. And Walter brought Tanya with us. It's so nice to see you. <laughs> Um, and, and uh, get also the, the, the view of Mexico later. It, it's definitely a beautiful one. Nice to see you again, on the, at least on the screen. But before we come uh, to your both expression, what you see, Walter, uh, you're a man who did in the last three decades a lot of business models. You're deeply in the B Corporation. You know Natura in Brazil. You know by heart your, your family makes big business. You're representing some of these businesses like Merck and Siemens in your family for a long time. Now we talk today about social business and the model of social business, a selfless, self-interest company, a company is 100% dedicated to, 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 to make a change, you know. Uh, we see impacts of everyone in the world. Maybe they have even a short-term impact bolder than the social business. But what you think personally after the discussion with your perspective as a real insider uh, in, in business, the social business model, based on selfless, on a non-loss, non-dividend company, can we really be a game changer? Or what's your opinion? Absolutely. I have no doubt that this is a very important uh, initiative. Um, I think that, um, you know, a lot of what Barbara and, uh, you know, and, and we all in the discussion and Harold and others have said, um, I tried to build a little bit on this. So first of all, I think, uh, you know, like Barbara also suggested, we have to think systemically. What is our added value to the system, right? So you know that I'm a vice president of Savodia. So I've been for decades involved in Savodia and social business and, uh, and helped to lead a very big social business movement that has various companies uh, that are all social businesses. And I think this is the perfect approach in a way to uh, healthcare. It's not the only approach, right? So as you said, my family company that's 142 years in Asia, we, my grandfather built the first uh, Western pharmacy in Thailand. So we have a very long history with uh, bringing these technologies to, to uh, you know, countries of the global South. And my brother is born there, my father is born there, you know, so. And I think that traditional business plays an important role, but as we can very easily see, it plays an insufficient role. It is organized by market forces that force it to behave in certain ways. Now I've worked the last 30 years to change those market forces to, to make business more moving towards regeneration. But obviously while we have come a long way, there's a very long way to go. And in the meantime, we cannot wait for it to completely arrive there. So social business has a incredible role to play. Mm -hmm. And I think on a number of different levels. First of all, healthcare has a lot to do with distribution and with trust. Very large scale distribution. You need to reach the people actually where they are. And when you reach them, they have to trust you. Because a lot of especially uh, low cost medication today are counterfeit um, uh, non-functional medicine that are sold by people who make a profit on a very cheap drug that is in fact no drug at all. Yeah. And um, 
with our distribution system into the villages in the most far away places, combined with the trust, with a really good product, we can really deliver this product that is a trustworthy product and combine the product with the kind of education that Barbara and others are talking about. Because I agree, the drug should be the last resort. A lot can be done before you ever need a drug, right? So when you look, for example, in Sri Lanka, the way rice farming is done uses so much pesticides that there is a massive occurrence of kidney disease. This is absolutely pre preventable without any drug. You just don't, you do regenerative agriculture and regenerative agriculture, as uh, you know, my friend, uh, uh, friends in Brazil demonstrate can be done on very small scale, but also on huge scale of thousands of hectares without any pesticide, without any GMO, it is more productive, more drought resistant, more pest resistant. So it starts already with our first medicine, which is food, right? And the air we breathe, uh, the environment we live in. Uh, then it has a lot to do also with lifestyle. Many people don't know that if they feed themselves and especially their children, lots of sugar, salt, fats, uh, that they set themselves up for uh, new lifestyle diseases. As you know now, obesity has bypassed undernutrition as the world's largest healthcare challenge around food. So it's, and we don't have to count the one against the other. We have to address hunger and obesity. And the, 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 the understanding of obesity often is very primitive. It's, it's like uh, calories and exercise, but in fact, you know, I've worked a lot in the favelas of Brazil with, with nutrition and, and obesity and uh, socioeconomic factors like the question of depression because of insecure living environments and so forth plays a huge role in obesity. And we know it from ourselves, right? When we feel stressed, we wanna eat something sweet. So there is a lot to do, but again, also there medicine is very important. So what I'm saying is, yeah. Uh, we should consider um, what is the, the actual need and then use our strengths to address those needs in the appropriate ways. There's another one, for example, there isn't enough research into pharma technology that is appropriate for usage in uh, global Southern conditions. For example, all the research in the, into the, the, the COVID vaccine was done with an eye towards Northern cultures and economies. Therefore, it all requires refrigeration. And for the global North to provide refrigeration is not so difficult. For the global South it's almost impossible. So, um, you know, I know of people who are doing research now that is providing vaccines that are insensitive to the temperature. So, um, and a big pharmaceutical company may not invest in that particular technology because it's not enough profitable, but we may invest in that. And we may yes. bind together with impact investors, with the UN, with other institutions that have exactly this target. So I think there is a, a lot we can do if we really analyze the system well, and we see what is our added value in this system. And uh, I will add one more thing, which is uh, the importance of uh, local or, or local culture uh, remedies, you know? So for example, um, you know that in India and, and now around the world, Ayurveda has uh, really expanded a lot and the use has used a lot. It's a, it's a fantastic medicine because it strengthens the immune system. That's the biggest problem about health is the immune system, right? And if you give everybody antibiotics, you are destroying uh, eventually the usefulness of antibiotics, which the biggest problem is agriculture, of course, farming, but also the use in people. And uh, also it really weakens your intestinal flora, which is essential for your immune system. 
So if you have a medicine that addresses the strengths of your intestinal flora, like for example, Ayurveda does, uh, you help the health, but you also help the self-respect of cultures of the global South. So I worked 20 years ago in Panama, helping to resuscitate and integrate the traditional Panamese uh, uh, medicine with the allopathic Western hospital medicine. And the effect was not only uh, lower costs in healthcare and uh, more effectiveness, but it was also uh, a respect in one's own culture. And that is also very important for many reasons, including the health. So I've maybe said enough. I mean, there are many points uh, and I'm happy to, to help you yeah. think about this. I'm completely uh, uh, enthusiastic to support you to build this enterprise. And I think it is absolutely needed. Uh, it it yeah. cannot be provided by governments. We know that was for microfinance. I mean, governments could have provided microfinance. They didn't. Um, yeah. You know, so it takes this, this entrepreneurship, yeah. this socially uh, heartful yeah. based entrepreneurship to make these things happen. Thanks a lot, Mark. I fully agree. And uh, it, it was a great uh, lecture during the last uh, week when we discussed about it with the doctors. We do know to hold it as a summary in the first time, we do know we need a global social business pharmacy company to be a good example, to show that pharmacy can play a good role, not only a bad role. I would probably also not there without the right treatment after my tuberculosis or after my, uh, you know, I was very uh, uh, helpful, thankful. So, so pharmacy can be a good treatment. We have okay. to do it social conscience driven. But if we go this path, think bigger, take five, make it, make it happen uh, and see it, give enough resources to do it holistic in the right way, also go, go for the unnecessary in the market. So coming back before we uh, before I ask Tanya on the, on her perspective to Mexico, what's uh, definitely a, a, a good one, or to your home, um, see it. Uh, Barbara reminds us then uh, it is possible, necessary from the praxis. You tell us as well. So if we can combine now the four most or five most influenced health institution on a noble way, let's say the Red Cross and the Half Moon is a noble one. I, I really love the organization. Uh, Doctors Without Borders did a great job. The Yunus and Kramin family did an enormous job. And combine uh, Mukwebe, who give us an example together, and address all what we need is give us $5 billion. Give it us in our hands. We built a social business fund under the leadership of Professor Yunus, under the clear way what's to be done. We take the first billion to invest in the game change and the pharmacy. And the rest, we can come up from every country in the world to make it happen. That's Walter where we need your, your help and your promotion on it to say, this could be doable. We always say this in the last year, start small, think small. But now I think it's a moment- no, I don't think, think you can big. start small and think small. I think this is for the past. I mean, it's very nice to, to start small and think small, but we have two big problems and we don't have enough time. We can't make people that suffer now wait because we want to not take risks. I think we need both, setting the seed. Every, every colibri who makes his drop in the forest uh, to cool down as uh, uh, Vangari Matai, given her example, you know, every colibri can make a drop to bring the fire down uh, on, on, when it's a, it's a forest burning. But both, we need the big one and the bold one. And that's what I go for. And I really hope you can help me on this or we all can shape it together. Uh, you brought a friend who is an old friend of us <laughs> as well. <laughs> Super nice to see you. So how is, when we was in Mexico, uh, uh, once uh, we had FEMSA there and there are, the, the head of FEMSA is uh, the biggest Coca-Cola uh, 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 person there. And then he talked to social business and he comes and says, oh, I want to do something. At the end, you say, stop your product. And that is the solution, you know. We see... <laughs> The product, what you do at the moment, is the problem. So I remember very quite well when Professor Yunus and me was on the Global Social Business Summit in Mexico, and we did it, and uh, you invited him there as well. So how we can stop the bad habit, and what's your expressions to say, oh, that could make a sense, or this is where we can do something here, maybe some feedback from your side. 
Yes, hello. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for uh, for the invitation. And so nice to see you again, um, and hopefully sharing more paths uh, in the future. But as as you mentioned, um, as you mentioned, Hans, uh, 40, 40, almost 40% of adults will be obese. So regarding your uh, question about FEMSA by 2030. So this is a major, major situation, not only in Mexico, but only uh, the whole of Latin America. Uh, so diabetes and heart disease is, is going to represent around 35% of uh, health issues in this region. Um, and at least in Mexico, but many other countries in the region also have the highest spending of OECD countries uh, out of pocket spending for health. Um, so this is one big issue that I think can be addressed with uh, very, um, with not huge investment. It's more cultural, uh, it's, it's more habit, it's more health. Uh, so in that way, uh, I, I, I am hearing Barbara and I, I want to talk a little bit about that. I think nurses um, need to be brought from the sideline to the center. And when I talk about nurses, I don't necessarily talk about nurses in a way like traditional, um, traditional medicine nurses in a hospital, but I also think that there's a lot of um, uh, traditional medicine women, at least here in Mexico and in the whole region, that hold, I think, three key aspects to health in their communities. One is that um, they were talking at, at some point about building trust and trustworthy outlets to build health. And I think these women hold a lot of information about their communities and health that they're not even considered or taken into account when uh, you know, doctors from the outside come into local communities. So I think these women hold uh, you know, history of, 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 of the kids, they not know them since they're young, they're really sort of community centers. And they're usually very, very knowledgeable about plant medicine and sort of local plant medicine. And in this region and also in a lot of regions in Asia, but from Mexico down all the way to, to the Amazon, uh, traditional plant medicine is huge and it's not considered in the pharmaceutical industry. And so if you go to local communities here in Oaxaca, you find that, you know, um, uh, villages that have a, a, a local, um, a local nurse or, you know, we, we call them parteras or, or um, yeah, like local mamas, we call them. They, they don't use traditional medicine, but their community is extremely healthy. So we want to, you know, put them in the center and understand not only their knowledge of traditional plant medicine, but also the health that they can bring to local communities. So if you talk about um, you know, integrating the local into medicine research, which is, I think, one huge aspect that pharmaceutical industries have brought in, but they haven't put at the center, you know, they, they just use certain aspects of plant medicine into, into their uh, formulas. Uh, the other one, I think, has to do with um, bringing in community kitchens. So I've traveled a lot in local communities. And unfortunately, as you mentioned, you know, FEMSA Coca Cola and Sabritas, like the fried chips and bimbo, they reach every single corner of uh, villages in Mexico. So people literally live out of these, these three products, so Coca-Cola, bimbo, and Sabritas. Um, and so we've done a lot of uh, projects, um, local projects, where we start uh, community kitchens and community gardens, and we help local women to have their backyard to produce a uh, food that is nutritious, that is good, and there's a local community that is working for that. And it's, it's wonderful, you know, because these, again, these women hold amazing, um, uh, amazing recipes that, they, that have been lost because of these, you know, saturated fats, nutritious, um, non-nutritious foods. And it's just a question of 
making that space. So, you know, I understand that there's this project for huge uh, pharma research and there's, there's two other factors that I would bring into the conversation that are very basic, but there's a revolution in health tech. So we, we support a lot of social entrepreneurs and we see so many brilliant ideas coming into uh, telemedicine and apps as Barbara also mentioned, but at least in Mexico, there's an internet connectivity program, pr problem. So there's you know, a very basic issue to be worked at so that this, uh, this technology can reach these communities. And I think if we can just make sure within this sort of implementation project that they mentioned, the importance of understanding how this can be implemented, I think internet is key to that. Um, and with it, within that connectivity, using blockchain to give um, a proper identity to the people within these communities. So bringing dignity to identity, because if we, if we keep on seeing just numbers and data uh, as people, then I think we're going to miss the point. If we can use internet blockchain to identify these people, to know where they are, uh, where, where they are at and sort of track them in time, yeah. uh, then I think we have uh, you know, wonderful information. And if you cross that over with you know, local nurses, capacity building programs to these women, because nobody is, is actually um, ha bringing into the picture, they're incredibly knowledgeable. And at least in, in, in the Latin American community, you can always go and ask, you know, where is, a, where is that, um, n not nurse in the way that we understand it, but the, the local women that, that cures people uh, in a broader sense, and, and you will always find one. So I would suggest also trying to identify these women and they can also build uh, knowledge and, and sort of make mini schools of nursing and, and, and medicine locally. So I think there's a huge opportunity there. There's a lot of knowledge already installed in those communities. Yeah, let's make it happen from Yucatan up to Mexico City. Let's make it happen in Mexico. Let's have, make it locally. I think this is what we all agree. We need the Grameen family in Bangladesh. We need the people on the ground in Mexico. We need the people on the ground, uh, people for people to have the best healthcare. We saw a lot of discussion about the the critical point of pharmacy, there is pharmacy who's doubtless helpful for us, see where we have no choice in the pharmacy, pharmaceutical therapy. We have all our horseradish, our curcum, our, our uh, secrets, we have the check foods, we have healthy food. It is all about to be healing by our daily behavior. But it, all what we need is to have businesses who takes care in the sense of running it as a social business. Could be this what Paolo Coelho once say, 10 years ago, and Professor Yunus, I never forget this when you say, oh, you will see there is a time, there is no choice than social business. And this time is coming now, and this time is here now. Professor Yunus, may, uh, for the last minute, if you can give a little bit feedback to the discussions, what you hear so far, what you think what's important for us. This is more or less a workshop, less a presentation. We want to create, we want to make it, we want to shape it, we want to have it done. By next year, we don't want to talk anymore. We will do it. By next year, we want to say we have done it. So what are the next steps on your side? What do you think what we should do, Professor Yunus? Uh, you have to remove your, um, your microphone, Professor Yunus. Unmute. Is it OK now? Now we Is can it? listen to okay, you. Yeah. Advice, okay. yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, Hans. No, it's uh, wonderful to organize this uh, discussion. Uh, this, this is a very important uh, contribution in the, on the subject that we are talking about. It came from many different directions, uh, dimensions of the issue that we are discussing. What I was uh, doing, uh, thinking about was 35 years back in Bangladesh. 35 years back, Bangladesh used to import 85% uh, of its medicine from outside. All the big companies are supplying the medicine in Bangladesh. Uh, and I said 35 years back because in, when it was 35 years back, government decided that they will not let the um, foreign medicine come in. Uh, they have to produce it in Bangladesh uh, they, if you want to sell it in Bangladesh. 
So many foreign companies didn't want to do that, to set up a, comp- a production facility in Bangladesh. And government offered facility for the local production companies. So pro- local production companies made deals with the foreign med- medical companies so that they will give the license to produce it in Bangladesh. So they thought at least since we cannot sell it to Bangladesh uh, by our own products, we'll sell our licenses to Bangladeshi companies to produce it. So a, a local pharmaceutical company emerged out of nowhere, little companies first. Now, 35 years later, Bangladesh is a major medicine exporter, drug exporter to the world within Asia, Africa, and now they are entering into US market. So this is what happens in 35 years. Just one decision not to let the foreign companies to bring, produce medicine into Bangladesh. So that's very exciting uh, thing for us. That's what I was in the morning saying, people coming from the USA, our friends to come visit home on the way back, they buy lots of medicine from Bangladesh to go because it's so expensive out there, same medicine. Uh, So this is the issue that I was talking about. When I talk about social business pharmaceutical company, I don't want to get involved with many other dimensions of healthcare. Healthcare is a big subject. We'll get lost. All I want to do is a very simple thing. Of all the pharmaceutical companies running in Bangladesh, forget about everywhere everywhere else. Can I buy off one of those pharmaceutical companies and say from today, it's a social business. Whatever they are producing, I'm not selecting which medicine, they they are running it, they're making money. So all I have done, bought of the pharmaceutical company, I said, now I don't want to make profit. So see what we can do, convert that. So we are not going to research what medicine is needed, what medicine is good for people, simply a company, a business. They are selling things inside the country, outside the country. And I take it over and I say, now it's a social business. We are not interested in maximizing profit. We're interested in serving people with these medicines. So what are the things I need to do so that it becomes, because it's a profit-making company, so I don't have to worry about that. So by changing all those price factors and so on and so on, can I survive making money enough to survive myself? That's all. This is So this is my problem. When I talk about the global company, I can translate the whole thing in a global situation. Can I buy one of those big pharmaceutical company and convert into a social business? I don't need to go into research. I do whatever they are doing. Exactly, but I do it for the people now. I don't want to make money. So that's the simplest thing I have for you. Can we prepare, do such a company, either which is running or which we can create? Just if I want to create a profit maximizing company, what are the things that I should consider? And that's how I'll do it, but I'll make it as a social business. That's all. Whether this medicine is right, this medicine is wrong, this controversy is go on, they will, this is never ending issues. It, and pharmaceutical companies are coming up every day. Some pharmaceutical companies probably close down every day too. But in that, it's, uh, the whole thing thrives. This is, this is the issue that we are raising. Can we pick one of them as, a, as something either we buy it or we replicate it and convert it to a social business? Because that's our intention to do that. Whatever medicine they are doing, in the beginning, we'll do exactly what they're doing. But we'll get smarter along the way will start saying, no, this medicine is not necessary, or if they can continue, but this medicine is very important, let's start producing this. Can we do that? And we'll see the, how the production line has to be changed and so on and so forth. We'll do that. So gradually we'll adapt ourselves into the direction rather than in day one, we are going absolutely different one and so on. Uh, I'm not planning that kind of thing. It's a, it's a very simple way to look at that. And where will the money coming in? Uh, Money can come many different sources. One of the things that we would like to talk about, uh, like many companies, many trusts uh, uh, who are investing in things where uh, they see is socially um, important, like uh, Bosch Foundation. Uh, Bosch Foundation has been doing that and say, here is a project. Uh, Would you like to support this as an investor? Not as a donor, as an investor, would you like to invest? Bosch Foundation does it all the time. That's what they, that's known for. Uh, so foundation like that. And uh, Tata Trust, for example, 
they've been investing in things. Would Tata Trust be interested in converting one of the Indian companies, pharmaceutical companies, to convert into a social business? So the join hands, these are the things which is what we do after we take over. Those are the things we can discuss. How do we do it, convert it? So investment come this way. Uh, like uh, Gates Foundation, for example. Gates Foundation's primary job, the day it was created, the so sole objective is the whole healthcare. That was uh, absolutely they are committed to healthcare. So they are all the billion dollar and billions of dollars they have been invest, uh, donating. They are all donate. They don't invest in anything. So all that they donate is in uh, healthcare. They are the one putting money in the uh, even vaccines and so on. But as a donation. So one the message that I would like to give them that's fine. You are doing uh, donations, but would you like to invest? You uh, either you use your own money to invest, or you for, probably in the USA you cannot use foundation money to invest. Uh, so can you do PRI investment? That's the same category that is allowed within the foundation five hundred one C three companies. Uh, you can do that. Uh, use PRI investment. Can you use PRI investment instead of donating every year the same amount of money? And giving it to the big companies to sell their products to the for, for the healthcare. Why don't you produce your own thing? Because you have the money, so once you invest, you don't have to go on buying their products. You sell your own products, uh, make it available to own products. So those are the messages that we can give out to the people those who want to do that. And we see many of, as I was mentioning in the morning, many uh, academic institutions, research institutions, uh, departments do all the research for uh, designing medicines, designing vaccines. And many of them uh, have already done it. Many of them done, but uh, didn't succeed. So didn't go far, but it's still working. They didn't give up, uh, but they do it uh, as a part of their research organization. They get some money from the government to uh, fund them for the research and so on. But the product of the research goes to the money-making companies to make money. So we can say that uh, we are creating a social business company. Would you like to do it for us together? You, you invest, you become part of us and your thing, what you have been devoted your time and energy and your skill and your talent to produce this and somebody is making money out of it rather than you help the people. So maybe some of them would like to collaborate with this uh, pharmaceutical company. Maybe, I don't know, maybe, because we have met lots of people in these social business uh, uh, days in the past and summits in the past, uh, who showed interest that, yes, we'd be very much interested to do that. Can we go back to them? You design things, whatever is in your pipeline, whatever is coming, we'll produce it. Uh, but uh, you, you now this would be a social business. So we'll be sharing it with everybody. In social business, we don't have any pattern. We don't keep any pattern. Right? It's all open for us. So we'll make it open because that's our philosophy. That's our theme that we want to do. So this is the direction that uh, I was mostly thinking about uh, doing, the, uh, getting the academic and so on. Last point I want to make is about, uh, no, two points. Uh, is, that, uh, is there a company who'd like to have a joint venture with us? Whatever you do, have a joint venture in another country. You're doing in country A, let's do it in the country B as a joint venture, like we did uh, uh, joint ventures with many corporate uh, organizations, Danone, McCain, and others. Uh, we'll have, say this, this is a um, joint venture, but joint venture social business. So this is, they have the technology, they have the thing, but we created a social business. So that they will say, okay, we are being attacked by everybody. Now at least people will not attack us because we created a social business. Why not? Let's give it a social business opportunity for them. We are not against the social business part of it. We are against only when they make $26 billion a, day, a, a year uh, out of the vaccine. Then we're very mad at them. That's why you do that. So when they create a social business wing, a social business uh, 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 as a separate entity, we're fine with us. This is the purpose of the whole thing. Uh, and we can do that. Can we encourage, can we get this uh, 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 joint venture idea uh, so that we can create this joint venture social business by the established companies themselves? This is not something that the, some tiny unknown people to do that. Very established company persuaded them, let's have a social business. You have a mega company. Let's have, have a start with a, a smaller company. Uh, located in Bangladesh, located in uh, Uganda, located in uh, Zimbabwe, whatever we, 
this is what is a social business company with it. Once we learn, once we see that it benefits people, then we can encourage other people to do that. And the last point that I wanted to make that uh, I say, uh, inside this organization, there are lots of dedicated people who would love to work for the social business rather than, as we feel uh, repulsive to the situation that they have created on the vaccine side. I'm sure inside this organization, a lot of people are feeling absolutely the same way that you, I, and others are feeling. And they would like to go outside and do something, uh, make happen exactly the way they wish uh, they could do the way we are explaining. So these are the kind of scenario that we have, how to find those people, how to find those companies, how to uh, talk to the uh, foundations and the trust uh, who may be interested as a part of their regular activity. They have done many other things. This would be one activity. They will be investing in a social business pharmaceutical company. So we are focusing only on the medicine part, not the varieties of the on this particular issue. We have other issues. We do the uh, nursing college, that's a separate issue. We do the hospital, uh, that's a separate issue. We do the digital he healthcare, that's a separate issue. Uh, so we have medical college, that's a separate issue. But this is a medicine issue. We focus on the medicine part, medicine and vaccines and whatever it comes. Uh, so this is what uh, we'd like to do. I'm sure this is the first time we're discussing. Uh, out of this discussion, we'll come up with something very concrete. And thank you for organizing this. And we had a very valuable contribution towards that direction. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Yunus. Yes, let's shape it, let's catch it, take it over, merger and acquisition, let's go for business, we go for medicine, we keep focus, 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 That's and it. all the rest we take care on a holistic way, on an individual way. I love the idea, Maria, we take a list of uh, in every region of the 100 pharmaceutical companies, right. and then we see who maybe want to be take over and say, I would love to be a social business. Join them. We got a clear task, uh, Professor Yunus. Happy, happy social business day. It's always thank good you. To catch a fish, bring the fish at home. Absolutely. Concentrate, focus, focus, focus. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. thank you very much, Tania. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans. Thank you to Hans and all the panelists, <laughs> Professor Yunus as well, uh, for sharing uh, his reflection on the session. Uh, this is where I will now hand, be handing over uh, the remaining proceedings to our colleague Shihab Kader to take you through the rest of the proceedings for the evening. It's almost midnight where I am, uh, down in the Southern Hemisphere in Sydney. It was, it's been a pleasure to be with you all day. I hope to rejoin tomorrow. Shihab, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Pramod. You did an awesome job and thank you for uh, being wide awake from down at the bottom of the planet Earth. So the, and thank you, uh, Grammy Creative Lab, for organizing such an astounding session. The speakers were magnificent. Uh, it was a really eye-opener for, for someone who has no uh, specific experience in the pharmaceutical industry or how one should endeavor in the path of social business in this particular industry. We had a lot of very insightful thoughts. And as always, Professor Ahmad Yunus took, uh, took his time to hone it in, uh, give us the main focal points and gave us an outline on how we should be going forward. The talk about a partnership that really uh, sings very well with us. Most of the Grameen social businesses started off with a good solid partnership from abroad. And that's how we learn from each other actually through various partnerships on the ground, especially in new markets. I also let, uh, remember one of the speakers from this uh, session, Harald Nasser, who was always reiterating the point that why is the poorest paying in absolute terms the highest prices for medicines and for other healthcare activities as well. So in this, in this sessions of the Social Business Day, even tomorrow onwards, you will see that we are focusing on the healthcare issues, the pandemics, and Professor Yunus's mess, overall message of no going back. So it will be constantly reiterated, reiterated again and again in various sessions. And as well as also Ms. Ms. Barbara Parfi also was saying that the cost of buying your way into the system because of corruption, especially in uh, emerging countries, in lower least developed countries, that also plays a crucial factor and a detrimental factor, in fact. So having said that, we now move on to our next session. Uh, it will be a, a keynote speech uh, given by a, a one of our social business friends called Li Shin. She, it's, up, it's scheduled to start for at 7.45, so we are a couple of minutes earlier. So I'm just going to give you a brief heads up of uh, who she is. Li Shin was, is the vice president of Kaishin Media, and she's also the MD of Kaishin Global. Uh, she led the company's global news and intelligence services. 
and she and also she takes part in the Kaizen's international branding and global events. And before this endeavor, she was the managing director of the Chinese Wall Street Journal and Chinese Dow Zone New Newswire. So I'm requesting uh, Li Xin to join in. Li Xin, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I'll turn on the mic. Perfect. Uh, where are you joining in from? Which part of the world are you from? Actually, I'm in Singapore, but most of oh. time is based in uh, Beijing. Oh, that's great. And how's the pandemic there faring at the moment? It's uh, fluctuating. So mm -hmm. some of the part was controlled very well, but uh, the flare ups here and there. So uh, obviously the real cure is the vaccination process. So every country is speeding that up. Right, right. So we are in, as you know, we are, we are telecasting live from Bangladesh and we just are about, are about to enter into our second lockdown. It's, it's, uh, it's not really scary, but it's, it's still a, a tight ship to run into. So we are just uh, two or three minutes away from your keynote speech. Our uh, tech team is figuring things out back, uh, back there and we'll let you in. As if you could just introduce yourself for a couple of minutes, that would be great. Okay. Uh, I think you give, uh, give me a very generous introduction already. I'll talk a few minutes probably about uh, Taishin Media and what we do. So um, it's called Taishin, but uh, if you can see behind me, it's Taishin. But uh, yeah. it means finance news in China. So we are independent mm -hmm. business media based in China and covers business and finance. You can see as a Chinese counterpart of uh, Dow Jones or Chinese counterpart of Financial Times. But we do care very strongly the social inclusive and equality. And we cover that throughout the years and um, follow the trends very closely. Fantastic, and is this your first social business day event? Indeed, indeed, but really Fantastic. the atmosphere here and the energy and the passion in, uh, in, in throughout Thank the you. whole day. So I think I would definitely come back and I would recommend more uh, our colleagues and uh, more people from China to join us. Absolutely, you would be happy to know that we have over 1000 registered guests from 77 countries joining in globally. And two years ago, we remember we did uh, did us, uh, our annual social business day that was in Bangkok, Thailand, co-hosted by AIT Thailand as well. And there were 1,600 registered participants coming in live on, uh, on the ground, not to mention the online guests as well. So with that happy note, uh, the floor is all yours, Ishin. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, hello, everyone. Good evening, Professor Yunus and all our guests uh, from the Asia time zone. It's truly a privilege to join the 11th Social Business Day, a very warm family gathering, although this is my first time. And Taishin Media definitely is very glad to be part of the extended family. Allow me to start by recounting our journey with Professor Yunus in enhancing financial inclusiveness in China. I remember very vividly our first interview with him in China back in 2006, a cover story titled, The Banker for the Poor. It was, uh, that was Professor Yunus' first visit to China, I believe, in a really packed schedule. He met with Chinese economic officials, central bankers, and he shared valuable firsthand experiences as well as high level insights. Our interview with him was scheduled for 11 p.m. at night. So imagine how popular and busy he was in China. But thanks to that single visit, the issue of microfinancing and microcredit for the first time became the hot topic and later became part of the mainstream finance in China. The impact was enormous. Before that, China was the only developing country without any formal institutional setup dedicated to microfinancing. And also what we learned from him for the first time is that micro lending to the poor is more effective if we lend to women. That very telling figure he shared with us, Grameen Bank lent more than 97% of its loans to women with strong interest among our Chinese readers. And then fast forward 13 years after our first meeting, Professor Yunus and co-founder of Grammy China, Mr. Gao Zhan, joined a special Taishin breakfast in Beijing in the year of 2019, together with Chinese financial officials and business leaders. And inclusive finance in China has already developed quite significantly since 2006. We witnessed an incredible growth. The low interest lending to inclusive projects totaled 1.2 trillion yuan and rural commercial bank lending totaled 300 billion yuan. And on top of that was innovative private players stepped into micro lending. Most of them are tech companies. Many of the names you will be familiar with including Alibaba and Tencent. 
and the founder of a new bank shared with us that his inspiration to set up a micro lending bank was exactly the Grameen Bank. So it seemed like there's a perfect storm combining strong social policy guidance and exponential growth of technology. But as Professor Yunus warned at the Taishan breakfast, technology is really a double-edged sword. We have to make sure that they are used for the right intention and there is a strong social component attached to that. It should be aimed for the poverty alleviation, not a new tool. For, so for wealth gathering, especially for illegal wealth gathering. And the recent tightening on financial, on fintech policies in China, if you follow our news, was partly aimed at that, making sure that fintech tools are generating the right social impacts and with controllable risk and public oversight. So in China's massive and quite effective poverty alleviation effort, enabling women was always a critical component. Half of the 700 million Chinese lifted out of poverty were women, for sure. But we also know that only providing the resources, including education, healthcare, and finance to low-income women is good, but is not good enough. It has to go hand in hand with increasing the capacities. And it's important to build a community. So Grameen China's various projects we observed ranging from the solidarity group to the weekly center meeting added a very important social element and truly made the effort sustainable. So throughout the years, I would love to share with you that Taixing as a media organization also tried to incorporate gender equality in our own team. More than 55 employees are women, but almost 60% of executives are women. So women are entrepreneur in my organization. The Taishin Foundation, now called the Wood Pecker Foundation, supported several female entrepreneur projects. And as China's most influential business media, we never stopped paying close attention to Grameen, to Professor Yunus, new endeavor, and to the very inspirational females, especially female entrepreneurs in China and in Asia. Of course, the biggest story now is what's next after COVID. It's clear that the society doesn't want to go back, like echoing the theme this year. We need to be prepared and move towards a new reality in which equality and inclusiveness is front and center. So empowering women entrepreneurs can work magic in achieving those goals. But how is COVID impacting the course of empowering women? Actually, it's not a very rosy picture. With COVID, digitalization has certainly accelerated. Consumption, education, financial services, medical care are all moving online. But it also requires digital literacy. And how are women doing in digital literacy? I'll share with you some numbers in Asia. According to International Telecommunication Union's 2019 data, Internet penetration rate for male in Asia Pacific is 45%, but for women in Asia, it's 41%. It's significantly lower, not just, from, um, not just than the male counterparts, but also from the global average for female, which is 48%. And regarding mobile ownership, which is very key to access internet, except for China, most Asian developing Asian countries has a clear gender gap. I would name a few places. In India, the male versus female mobile ownership is 80% versus 59%. In Pakistan, it's 78% versus 50%. And in Bangladesh, it's 86% versus 58%. So there is clearly a digital gender gap. I'll give you one another example on how this gap will impact women entrepreneurs. The assistant central bank governor in Cambodia, Siri Chia, told me last week, they just rolled out e-wallets in Cambodia. But soon they realized that most of the mobile wallets, which served as the first entry point to access a variety of financial services, most of the mobile wallets, 66%, are owned by male. She worried that by accelerating the digitalization of financial services, they unintentionally excluded women from that. But meanwhile, another number is also very telling. What Professor Yunus told us 15 years ago in his China visit still hold true that women are more responsible. 
with Cambodia launch this year a new mobile application to check financial health. Guess what? 80% of the people who check the financial health are women. Women do care more about the financial health and are more responsible lenders. So from our observation, our news coverage, our interaction with the key stakeholders such as Grameen and Professor Yuris, we realized that empowering women entrepreneurship is as important as it is challenging. Technologies provide another new layer of that very challenge. It's really important to help the low-income women and to help with the entrepreneurial journey in Asia as well as the rest of the world. But to really do that, we need to put in place institutional infrastructure to increase their access to key resources. We need to actively break social stereotypes and change cultural expectations. We need to build a strong community like Remy China is doing and increase the visibility of those who succeeded and who tried. And we also need to equip them urgently with the digital know-how. So to answer the question Professor Yunus posed to us this afternoon, there's no going back, but what's next? Technology is certainly part of the next. It's shaping up our future. We need to pay special attention to leveraging technology to enable women and make sure the usage, the usage of the very powerful tool is inclusive and equal. And how to do that? I think the answer to me lies in the cornerstones of Grammy Bank, mutual trust, participation, and creativity. With a growing family like what we have today, with passion and dedication, we should and we will bring the equality to a new level. So thank you very much. And I enjoyed the conversation and look forward to more sharing of insights from all of you. Thank you, Lishin. That was very informative. The way you uh, talked about using public oversight more positively and trying to make it an enabling environment for the women, especially. And it's quite insightful to know that half of the Chinese people who are lifted out of poverty were women. And 60% of the women in Cashing Foundation are, 60% uh, of the employees are women. That's also really good to know. And as you know, out of the seven principles of social business as laid out by Professor Yunus, one of them is gender sensitivity and strictly adhering to it in these trying times. And when you're talking about the mobile mobile ownership, I'm sure nobody needs to tell you that Professor Ramad Dinus was the, one of the pioneers of bringing in mobile technology to the rural masses with Grameen phone back in the heyday. And 86% uh, the male mobile ratio versus 58% in with the woman mobile ratio. That needs a bit of work. But when we compare ourselves with India and Pakistan, I think we are a bit ahead. So that's kudos to us. But there's still a long way to go. Mm -hmm. And it is quite quite, quite insightful. Thank you very much for your valuable words. And hopefully we will uh, see you in the upcoming sessions as well as a participant. So enjoy. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we conclude our keynote speech from Lee Shin. She was talking about uh, women empowerment. And moving on, we have another interesting social business updates from three valuable social business friends from a long time. So we have Kishwar Emdad. So Kishwar Bhai is the Managing Director of Grameen Healthcare Services. And after he's done, he, he will, uh, Mr. Kazi Hawk, the CEO of Grameen Intel, and Naren Sudaranjan will be also talking both together. So we are about to start in a couple of minutes. So just to lay out the format, it's going to be a very brief and uh, impactful session for 15 minutes only. The speaker speaks for five minutes, and then there's a two minutes uh, remaining for Q&A question and answers. So it's total for seven minutes and there will be a buzzer with that annoying sound like which goes like this. So when you hear that, that means you're almost out of time. So after the seven minutes, we will move to uh, Mr. Kazi Hawk uh, and Mr. Narayan. So I wonder if Kikifer Bhai is already here. Uh, give me access uh, to the you know video access. 